enough of Keanu. Yes, it's true. Whenever we see you in another movie, get to wishing that you were in them all. Our hearts cry out, Keanu had an age today in 30 years. Now we're looking back on your of Keanu. And then, yeah, he had, like, a, almost a Hollywood career off of, like, the strength of his radio BBC radio show, I believe, with Matt Morgan. Mm-hmm. And then... Um, well, he's very, like, interesting because he's so fast and runs on, like, such a high-octane, right. quick level where he can, like, always, like, respond and parry anything that's being thrown at him and do it so... and speak so quickly and do it in a way that's, like... He has a very eloquent... Like, it seems like well thought out thing that but he's just like throwing at you like it's not a big deal. So he's kind of compelling to watch. I but really it's, like A him. big part of his identity was always also tied to like becoming sober later on. Yeah. And so then like he became very vocal for abstinence based recovery, Remember? which led into his political like leanings yeah. and his idea of like he moved to LA for a while. He married Katy Perry. He thought he was going to be in Hollywood. Uh, he, he was engaged to Katy Perry and then he called it off via a text message right before she went on stage because it's in her documentary. Oh my God. Yeah. It's, really? It, 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 I mean, I, there's I no secret. I, He's like been a piece of shit for a lot I haven't lot, seen uh, uh, the Katy Perry like sort of like concert documentary, but apparently it's like one of the better ones. Uh, or maybe, or like maybe the best one of like the sort of recent crop. But the one scene I've seen is a part where she's like about to go like play the stadium show. Yeah. And then Russell Brand calls Pulls off their engagement via a text, and then she has to like compose herself in like a minute, <laughs> like, and then go out on stage. It, it's like <laughs> actually All these affirming anthemic it's like, songs, like really sad, but also like really impressive to watch. Right, okay, e, what, here's the deal. It's like I don't I really want to, to marry you. Yeah. So yeah, Wait, now he's like a, a guru. Did you know that Russell? I, sorry, I'm looking at Russell Wren's IMDb. He's yeah. on 11 episodes of Ballers. He is? <laughs> yep. Not, not as himself. He just, I mean, he still needs to pay the bills, I suppose. He can't just make YouTube videos now talking about yeah, anxiety really right, but, but, and but yoga. You, you look at his whole career where it's like, you know, he, he comes on the scene and like, you know, forgetting Sarah Marshall. Yeah. And then he gets a spinoff as that character where he's the lead yeah. in Get Into the Greek. And then it's like, oh, wow, let's remake Arthur with this guy. He broke over right. into the American marketplace, essentially. Yeah, uh, let's put him in, like, Rock of Ages. He's yeah. going to be, like, like, a, like, Despicable Me too. It seems like the right moves, right? Yeah. And yeah. Still, he did voice acting for a while after that, didn't he? He's in the movie. He's got a great voice. He's in the movie Trolls. Yes. Uh, but then it just kind of drops off. And well, I'm a troll. He's a troll. I've got a little gem in my belly button. Do those? Je- I mean, I'm sure those movies. Those movies, they're like made out of felt or something weird. Like the uh, whole yeah, world is made like, out of like, felt. I, I haven't seen and yarn. The, the movie Trolls, but just looking at the trailer and looking for the, at the trailer for the sequel, they're visually kind of appealing. Just the textures in them. They yeah. were. It's very much like just using the whole visceral draw of like plushy toys and like yeah. little velvet yeah. and felt things and just like. If I was a child, I'd be definitely be like, I want to live in there. It's yeah. basically my bed. And yeah. Justin Timberlake is essentially your <laughs> your anthem for that entire time. <laughs> I got sunshine in my pocket. I got blue sky in my head. Oh, Whatever the lyrics fuck, are. Fuck, dude. Yeah. You know, I was, that, I was that listening to a very dude. catchy song. Oh, it was dude. such a catchy it was, song. And it's weird because I'm, they I'm, were trying so hard to do the Pharrell. <laughs> well, and they, you know what? They, they worked because yeah. I have attended weddings where, like, you know, it's like the reception and, uh, uh, and like the DJ is starting out and people yeah. aren't really getting up and I have just witnessed the DJ drops can't stop the feeling dance floor <laughs> is filled instantly yeah and I and I'm just like this works it, you know, it works know? hard it's it's almost um, it's on par I think with 24 karat magic is like one of those songs that's came out a little bit more recent than a lot of the classics but or it's just like a guaranteed like everybody seems pretty like there's you almost some, like have to go well, on yeah this well i mean i think it's like happy it's right. like there's I like mean, a formula to it like yeah. there's like the science of music that like right. literally they use for these kind of things which is why can't stop the feeling is a song written and produced by max martin yes the swedish genius of pop music and that was the thing where they're like okay we have to have like yeah. a perfect hit song that will be inescapable that every inescapable. That, that people will enjoy uh, and it's like people they that's always supplicate released, like, themselves like, to Max Martin like Sir? months before tr- the movie Trolls like people <laughs> yeah. didn't even realize that it was like it's like they they got 
the public into the song. Right. And then and, and then it's like, oh, that song that you've been loving all year, by the way, it's it's the theme song for trolls. Damn, it's like it, in Zoolander when they trigger Derek Zoolander with relax. Yeah. It's like they made the song, got everybody entranced by it, and then we're like, trolls will be released in November of this year. And well, then they click the song on the entire public pet, was like, like, we gotta watch it. Like you know, because I work marketing adjacent and like right. the whole th- this whole like idea that they seem to f- keep rediscovering like morons every couple of decades where it's like if we like put a cool song everyone loves over a product it's amazing how positively people like uh uh you know sort of like involuntarily respond to the the product yeah well, yeah they keep rediscovering this fucking idea i i like <laughs> it's just happened again which is why i'm annoyed like because, I, but but people you're saying the problem is they're discovering it again as if it's a new idea they're like wow did you know yeah like when people come to like when like you know brand ambassadors and whatever the fuck come and are like describing at, strategies at your job uh yeah. not at my job because because i'm like i'm like three layers of you know involved removed from it like the company is i still have no idea what you. i do. will definitely not go into it here but <laughs> the whole point is like, like we've been recording for the past five minutes sure <clears throat> okay <clears throat> yo do you remember isn't it so funny that jordan hey. peterson is addicted to clonopin now yes um speaking of him and russell brand the only interview with him really worth watching is when he is talking to russell brand because russell brand because he's just like this like nimble kind of like New agey guy, but yeah. like pretty smart and able to like phrase things well enough, yeah, uh, to be taken seriously. Like gets a lot more mileage out of his interview, picking at Jordan Peterson so that he actually like explains himself a little bit, yeah, without, without falling into his usual just like circular logic. Yeah, circular logic or his like well worn like catchphrases almost that no one argues against. Like he gets argued against there, and it's like kind of satisfying to watch. I'm of two minds because I feel kind of bad for him. And also, well, Klonopin like is anti-anxiety medication. Klonopin. Klonopin. Klonopin is when you stick up your ass. <laughs> <laughs> That's anti-booty anxiety. Yeah. <laughs> when your butt's sweating it out, and yeah. you're like, "How do I make my butt less nervous?" Yeah, classic. Maybe I'll start the episode on that. <laughs> yeah, hi. <laughs> yeah, I mean, whatever. We've been recording for a while, but I haven't decided at what point I'm actually gonna like begin the episode. You know, what we should do yes. is we should just like keep lengthening the <laughs> intro until we've just a cl- like there's just one minute where we're talking about the movie and then we've just changed completely the subject yeah are we have a new podcast now and it's called we begin it at the end yeah it's like exactly. a manga we do manga style podcasting <laughs> <laughs> that's it you listen to it from right to left yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah easy enough that's not yeah. alienating exactly that'll be it we'll, we'll just I mean, the episode will still be two hours but we'll just push the part where we start talking about Keanu further and further back right yeah this is a good plan. Mm-hmm. This is a great plan. I think our listenership will really expand if yeah. we do this. Listen, I'm what they call a disruptor and an oh. ideas guy. Yeah, you're that's like Russell thing. Brand. That's another thing. Yeah. <laughs> I like cool niche things like Russell Brand and uh, yeah. Trolls, Yoga, the movie, and <laughs> Justin Timberlake. And that one song from Trolls. The I love movie. Man of the Woods, that album. That's about it. It's a niche well, album. Honestly, that is a hot take. To be like my favorite Justin Timberlake album is Man of the Woods. I have no yeah. f- strong feelings and about Justin 2020. Timberlake. Uh, he seems like a nice guy. Future Sex Love Sounds is a good album. It is uh, good. I'll take your word for uh, it. And uh, honestly, Justified, his first album, some like bangers on I'm assuming, it's got Crimey River yeah Yo, yeah I was also listening That's to a good song. JPEG Mafia's cover of uh, Call Me Maybe very good very weird interesting hey. yeah I have not uh, heard it but yeah. I can say the original Call Me Maybe is a good song it's great yeah. that little string thing. with some distance I'm into it again I used to hate it <laughs> oh I uh, used to hate that song yeah well, I, when you can't avoid something it sucks I never yeah. did yeah. but Even like, if you well, like it it yeah, was one of those true. weird flukes because no one knew who Carly Rae Jepsen was. Right. And then it was just this song that came out of nowhere and was inescapable. It yeah. wasn't like, oh, it's the new single from like... Well, everybody was like, is this Taylor Swift? I don't understand. Yeah. And then people learned that, that CRJ <laughs> is one of the great pop musicians of our time. Yeah. And, uh, and she just kept cranking out good songs. Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm sick also. All right. So oh, forgive we, we, Matt if his voice you're, is... You're still? Yeah, dude. Oh, what, I you thought, got a cold? I thought it was going to be like a 48-hour thing like me. No, you're still sick too, kind of. No, I'm not. Yeah, you are. I got over it in two days. Sick I, in the head. You, you mean because I sneezed earlier? <laughs> yeah, Pat, did one you, sneeze? Pat, you crazy. You sick. <laughs> I was you sick a couple of days me? ago. You sick on the mic. That's all yeah. I mean, dude. Oh! You ill. That, yeah. Uh, Compliment. I'm, I genuinely, I'm sick though. I have a cold. Have all you right. been taking care of yourself? No. Have you been hydrating and eating soup and all that? 
I feel like, I don't know, man. You drink so much water. I got drank so much water one day, I felt sick. And I was like. Yeah, you can't. This yeah. is just going to stretch your stomach out. I was pissing constantly. And I was like, this feels bad too. Oh, no. <laughs> I, I, I always feel good. What, what I'm like, what I'm not feeling good. And then I just drink constant water and I constantly yeah. have to pee. I'm like. Flushing it, yourself out. Yeah. I, I. This is not really how it works. But in my head, I'm, I'm like, I am just getting like, like, like flushing this, the, the, the germs and stuff out of my body. It's, it's the same. Way Everything's that, coming out dick hole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's the same. Push way, it all out. It's the same way that I like thinking of like <laughs> exercise and like sweating as I, I like the, the expression of like, uh, of. Uh, was it like melting f- fat? The, the fat, the, the yeah. fat melts away. I'm like, yeah. I like that. I like that is not really what's happening. But the visual is is stimulating and evocative. I don't exactly. know. It makes me think of delicious bacon and foods cooked in in yeah. You like oil, throw it down and then the I'm grill. just like, I want to eat again. Cook those fats out. You of You get it. back yeah. from the gym and you're like, make, might as well cook that entire pack of bacon. Right oh my now. god! You, ever, you know when shit's cooked in like duck fat and you're like, oh, yes, yeah. <laughs> yes, please, <laughs> duck fat. Yeah, <laughs> damn. Wait, can we just like? Buy some duck fat somewhere? Yeah, dude. Where do you buy duck fat? You go to a fancy grocery store. Just like pour it all in the frying pan. Just like toss food in there. Just like cooking it in duck fat. Yeah, I don't know, it seems you weird. Cook up some, fry up some french fries and then like cook them in the What, duck they fat? taste like a little ducky? Like I, why would you cook french fries in duck fat? What, like, do you want it, like, slightly duck flavored? I just don't understand the, good. the appeal. Duck is good, but, like, so, yeah, I mean, the end. So, okay. I, okay. As you can tell, the if fucking you. Fucking rationale food tastes good. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right, fine. But look. So, so, like, as as you can tell from our conversation so far, <laughs> this is a podcast about Keanu Reeves. Let's start I, and I just want to say welcome to Can't Get Enough of Keanu, mm. the internet's premier Keanu Reeves podcast, in which we explore the filmography of that great, ageless, enigmatic Canadian actor movie by movie. I'm Patrick Willis. I'm Jake Torpy. Hello. And I'm, I'm uh, and I'm Matthew. Matthew. Yeah. You went back to I your demand full name. My full, yeah. You're like Prince. <laughs> okay. You have one name. You're yeah. just Matthew. Few. For your, your, few. You're, you're like Topher Grace. Yeah. I'm few. Few. <laughs> few Torpy. <I'm> few Torpy. <laughs> few. We have we have pretty good ones. I would be I, I would be bad. I'd be Cub. You'd be Cobb. Tor- Cobb. Tor- no. Yeah. <laughs> I'd be, be Cobb. 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 But Ben. Ben would be Jim and Torpy. Oh, Benjamin, that'd be sick. Okay, that's Jamin great. Torpy, Jamin. That, also, <laughs> our other brother, Jamin. Also, Jake, you're just uh, Leonardo DiCaprio in Inception. He's Cobb. Yeah. Well, that's his last name. But oh, everyone, yeah, but yeah, calls you're him right. Cobb. Yeah, you're he has right. the funniest name in that movie. What is his first name in that movie? Dom. Dom Cobb. <laughs> Dom Cobb. Damn. Why? But like, no one. Hey, I, I Christopher don't know. Nolan and your brother, whatever his name is, don't make the character that name. It's so silly. Dom sounding. Cobb. Dom, Dom Cobb. Cobb. Fuck it, Dom yeah. Cobb in but your no brain. No one calls him changing your dreams. They just say Cobb. Yeah. But anyway, that's you. Yeah. And uh, and that's the you. If it's, if wait, it's wait, 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 wait. Teddy Daniels. I wonder if that's like also, a, yeah. like a it's Nolan. So what if it's just some sort of like what he th- thinks is a clever like anagram or something? But it's not. It could. It, it could, could. I don't know. Could, oh, an anagram for like. He's like the ultimate like sort of middle brow. But mistakenly intellectual director. <laughs> so <okay. laughs> that's that's uh, no. He's, he's better than that. Yeah, he's yeah, he's, he's not, a treasure. He's not above an anagram. I don't think though. <laughs> no, he's least. not above an anagram. Yeah. But he's a great director. No, he he just he likes really like he likes like monosyllabic protagonist yeah. names. I that's know. just it. Like how you would name a dog so it knows to come to you. Yeah, exactly. Basically, yeah. yeah. That's Chris Nolan. That's Chris Nolan to his audience. That, Dom Cobb. Just, <laughs> I'm just being an unnecessarily antagonistic. Uh, as usual. Yeah. Because it's fun. No, dude. the, the yeah. thing that was, I, I feel like... I love it, chaos like uh, Chris Nolan's Joker does for its own sake. What, what about the The Walker? The Walker? Walking Phoenix Joker. Oh, is that what they're calling him now? No, that's like a like a what are not my Joe high? Keen Phoenix. No. <laughs> just joking. <laughs> just joking. <laughs> just joking. <laughs> oh, just joking. <laughs> that's actually very good. Thanks. Uh, no, I no, I feel like if you were a Theo, got it, baby. <laughs> if you were okay, I feel like Theo, you should be like like a, a stunt man, and like you land a stunt, and then you, and then there's like a big pause, and you go. Few. Yeah, you wipe your phone. And then everyone erupts. <laughs> it's, entire, erupts it's entirely based on that one bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. An evil can evil type guy. Yeah. Exactly. Then. But but you land and everyone's like oh, in stunned silence and you and you just like look at the camera, smirk. Few. No sweat few. to be seen anywhere, but I'm just like, Few, that was a close yeah. one. <laughs> That's it. So this is um 
I'm Rick, by the way. Tune in. That's just a name. Nothing <laughs> exciting. Just a name. Oh yeah, Rick. Tune but that in works. tomorrow. Yeah, we are talking about it. <laughs> Tune in tomorrow. Oh. As usual, like we're ten minutes and I'm like, is this our worst episode? No. Ever? Well, let's no. let's be upfront. Tune in tomorrow. It's a dud of a movie. It's a, it's a big turkey. It's, it's not a, it's not good. But I think epic fail. Uh, it's a 1990 comedy not film. Not funny. Uh, it's directed by John Emil. <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, we, we'll John talk Emil. about John Emil in a bit uh, because he would make other like you know pretty big Hollywood movies. Mm-hmm. But. I think we've hit a very important point in this podcast about mm. our dude Keanu. This is the first instance of uh, of uh, where I, this is what I would call Keanu's first bad performance. Yeah, and I, and the first instance, and we will encounter this again, where he tries to do an accent, yeah. and he just can't do it, and it hurts the movie. And it's a particularly yeah. tricky one, you know. Yeah, I find that like more hyper spe- hyper specific regional accents are tough. We're kind of like so he's doing a sort of Cajun-y kind of like New York, New Orleans. Sorry, uh, Matt, don't you mean Nolans? Yeah, yeah. If you were doing Matt, few Nolans. God, I can't even do it. This is a really hard one. I've never tried to do that's what I mean. This is one of those guys. You know, it's Nolans. Ugh. Ugh. Do you think that's good? <laughs> you know, it's like how people from uh, from Louisville. New Orleans <laughs> say it right. It's like you know, it's like Louisville, Kentucky. New Orleans. It's like Louisville, Kentucky. Yeah, Louisville. Right, right. Worcester, Mass. Just all those vowels, just all, like mush together in your throat while you're trying to say them. So he's no, like, oh, man. I couldn't possibly. Oh, my name is. Uh, dude, I am part of the Beauregard the family. Jewel, he's Foghorn Leghorn. He's yeah, trying for Foghorn of, Leghorn. Little, there's a touch of Foghorn uh, but, Leghorn. Well, yeah. That basically is what our caricature of an accent that we're doing. No, come on now. <laughs> come on now. Come on, take it. Take Matt, it. I sit on the porch. Matt, you can speak more naturally in this voice than Keanu could in this entire movie. Yeah, like so this that is was a, too good. So I'm actually doing it too good and awesome. I so think, I, you're I think doing we'll, it better than Keanu did, uh, uh, which is badly. Casting agents, uh, cast Matt Torpy in movies and uh, and, is, and anyone who, who's working on, on Denny Villeneuve's I'm, Dune, the, cast Matt, make sure he dies in the movie. Hashtag let Matt die in Dune. Yeah, let yes. Matt get Shot but I'm also a chameleon, the they call it a chameleon of the throat. <laughs> a throat chameleon. Yeah, where I can Ew. I can take on the the regional. No, what I was saying. Can I embarrass Matt for a second? Yeah, Matt, you're a talented actor, and you don't give yourself enough credit. That is true. Thanks, you man. do. It's nice to hear that sometimes. I guess. <laughs> Good. I'm glad you feel better about that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you also could go back in time because we already have noted, and the New York Times has noted <laughs> that you do share a passing resemblance, and you have also been called. By a YouTube some, commenter. some commenter on YouTube that you were like the like down south hillbilly you know, hillbilly Keanu Reeves. Keanu Reeves hillbilly Keanu Reeves you so know where New Orleans is in the south from, listen yeah. from New Orleans our likeness to each other decreases with each passing year <laughs> yes it does <laughs> but uh, what I was gonna say though was that like this is one of those weird things where um, because we know how Keanu approaches performances I have this faith that in this he's doing the similar thing where he i think he really really is trying and so there's almost this like um it's not a pass because like it was still bad but like (laughs) i just there's something almost charming about his fit like when he falls on his face too like he does in this where he's just he's so ill cast and like but i don't know you can really tell that he's um I feel like he is trying no, really hard. It, 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 yeah, that's always going to be the case. We're with going him. to talk about this again, obviously, with Bram Stoker's Dracula, as hell. and and yeah. and e for effort. But I feel like this is exactly the kind of movie that earned Keanu that reputation as like a bad wooden actor, right. which was it's it's clearly it's not accurate because this is one movie in like this is what like our fifteenth episode. Yeah, and so. Like everything else, even even like discounting the the recent movies we've covered, I uh, you know he hasn't been like this in any of the others. There's... But this is just this case where because he this accent does not come naturally to him, and he's struggling so much, and he's clearly put in so much effort to try to like figure out like all the aspect of this accent. I feel like 
this hurts his whole performance because he's concentrating so much on trying to nail these sounds yeah that, uh, and getting the words w- out right with his w- with his mouth that that <laughs> mouth there's sounds. like that there isn't like a performance there right that that he's just way less compelling than he usually is because he's putting everything into just trying to get the accent he's right. so excited right. to mediocrely mediocrely kind of succeed at saying lines in a somewhat uh new orleans sort of style way. i think even <laughs> our boy joshy mr hartnett despite the fact that we also consider him somebody who can't handle accents properly um still can balance the ability to that act within a scene while still concentrating on doing an accent despite the fact that he sort of fails at that he never josh harden never really fails at like delivering at least some kind of performance but i agree with you keanu here is just floundering and, which is and funny it doesn't because- help though too because we were talking about you know like in dangerous liaisons right nobody has an accent in that movie keanu's like trying for like a more genteel sounding voice mm-hmm. but right. at the same time this movie's tough because he's the main character. I mean, we get yeah. the f- the movie is resting on his shoulders where and it wasn't in Dangerous Liaisons. But also the two other major characters, yeah, uh, they don't have these thick New Orleans accents. Yeah, they don't even try. Barbara it? Hershey is coming from New York. Yeah, and she's Peter, doing. Peter Falk is just. From New I don't York know. too. <laughs> Where I, I, Peter I don't know. Is from. He's just talking however he wants. Yeah, and actually he's talking in a lot of different voices. But right, we'll yes, get he is. to that. I mean, Peter Falk is the bright and shining point in this film. I love him just in general. I think he's just like, he's like just another one of my personally like just favorite actors. You know, I've he's never, great. I've never seen an episode of Columbo. No? No. I actually uh, didn't, I just learned very recently that Columbo was not what I thought it was. <laughs> I, Okay. I assumed for years that... I was aware of Columbo. Right. I know what it is. I know it's got Peter Falk. I know it ran for many, many years. I assumed it was like a Perry Mason type show where there's like 300 episodes and it's all the same thing. Yeah. I learned, I think two weeks ago, that Columbo were basically like TV movies and each episode... The seasons are only like six episodes each and each episode is like 90 minutes long. Yeah. I had no idea my whole life. I've 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 never watched Columbo. My okay, my okay. relationship with Peter Falk mainly resides in John Cassavetes movies. Ah, yeah. Which of which I've seen I think maybe all of them, but he's just basically a good friend of his and so shows I I've seen Mikey and Nikki, which is a great movie. That's an I, Elaine May movie. I've not seen but that. But Husbands Husbands, he's John Cassavetes, yeah. like he's great in all the uh, you know, uh, a woman under the influence. He's awesome as Jenna Rowland's husband. He's like, so weird and fits really well, though, in Wings of Desire. Like, uh, yeah, I haven't seen Wings of Desire, like, but it's just so weird to see like a, a Wim Wenders movie and then like Peter Falk is there. He's like uh, he's like in Germany or whatever. It's funny though. This is the first time I've seen Peter Falk, and I think recognize that he's kind of cockeyed. Oh yeah, one I eye's like, always squinting, and the other's like, and but like one of them's also like looking a little bit in a different mm-hmm. direction. I I never noticed that for some weird reason. Weird, yeah, cause yeah, it's pretty. It's, it's very like pronounced Forrest here. Forrest Whitaker levels. It's no, like. Forrest Whitaker. <laughs> Forrest Whitaker just has an eye that's like slightly more closed than the other, but he doesn't have a pupil that's literally pointing in a slightly different direction. I mean, Peter Falk has literally got like eyes that are looking in different directions. Yeah. Got a lazy eye. Um, by the way, we should mention how we watched this movie because yeah. so far that this is the toughest movie. This to might track be the down. deepest cut thus far. You can find this in seven parts on YouTube. <laughs> uh, that's also the only way to really watch it online, unless because, you want to buy the DVD. Uh, the out of print DVD. Yeah, which is weird because like I understood why Flying slash Teenage Dream slash Dream to Believe was so mm-hmm. hard to find because that was by like a tiny little production company. Yeah, and it seemed to be owned by multiple different companies and has three different titles. Yep, this is. <laughs> was just a Hollywood movie made in 1990 with yeah. movie stars. Yeah. You and can get this. You can't rent it anywhere. You know what you can get this as? It's this weird genre of DVDs that I've always found funny, which is like the Peter Falk collection, oh, yeah. where you get oh, three oh. Peter Falk performances in one case. <laughs> and I'm just like, you know, like my grandpa would buy movies like this. He would get like uh, yeah. like uh, the Michael Douglas, like just five Michael Douglas <laughs> Michael films. Doug- <laughs> it's like in falling down and like... Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, uh, no, shining through and falling down, <laughs> and like all these Michael Douglas angry movies old man that, ones, but yeah. then like only yeah. Wall Street two. Yeah, yes. you get just these weird things, but like you're like, who? What company licenses out like the ability to make a collection of five feature films, all from different studios? I'd have to right. assume, yeah. and and they're just like all cohesively under the theme of like an actor or whatever. 
Like I see these all the times when I'm in like a, not that I'm in Best Buys a lot, but you know, Jake, like the Jake, last time I was in a Best on, Buy. Come on, Jake, you're in Best Buy. <laughs> your every, fave okay, I'm in Best Buy. I was in this morning. I like to touch all the technology. <laughs> I do. I touch all the SD cards and they tell me to leave. <laughs> you just love that Geek Squad. Yeah, I love, I love just like, like hanging with Geek Squad. Uh, the thing is that Jake aspires to be a member of the Geek Squad. Yeah. Every, every week he goes and applies again. They're always like, you're just not geeky enough. I know. I show Jake, up. I Jake, wear the you shirt. jock. I, ju- you know, bully, you I keep showing up and they can just see all the testosteronic things that are exuding out of my testosteronic body. things. Testosterone. <laughs> exuding, huh? <laughs> Testosterone, yeah. That's, uh, you that's, just give uh, them a wedgie and you're like, ah, oh, shit, I shouldn't have done that. And they're like, no, go away. Yeah, I keep lurking in the bathroom and sticking their heads in the toilet. <laughs> hanging them up on the, the bathroom stalls by their underpants. Classic Cobb. Yeah. Wait, wait, what, what if Cobb is dark, Jake? <laughs> Dom Cobb is Dark Jake. No, no, I don't get it. Okay, remember how you know? Oh, Cobb. uh, Yeah, the second half of my name is Few and Cobb. Uh, Yeah, uh, uh, Jamen. You know your brother Ben. Jamen. Yeah, Uh, Rick for me. (laughs) What if those are? You know, what if that's like (laughs) Nega? You just get to be Rick. Yeah, well, because well, Pat, what Pat Rick. Do? I Pat know, Rick. but it's annoying that you get to be Rick. It's just, <laughs> no, but yeah. see, I wish I had a fun one like you know, like yours. That those like, yeah. like wacky yeah. names. Mine's just a, mine's just a name. Yeah. Well, the, the classic is to reverse your name, and that's how you make like alien names for yourself. Wait, do you guys remember how you made uh, your Star Wars names? No. What is the rule? Okay, so mine. Uh, it's the last. I remember this from sixth grade, just because I. I uh, a friend and I would like call each other by ours for like a long time until mine just like stuck in my head. It's the last three letters of your last name, mm-hmm. and the first two letters of your first name. Okay, that for that's your the first name. For okay, your Star Wars name. And the first okay. two letters of your first name. Yeah. Okay. 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 <laughs> really stupid already. <laughs> so you're 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 Pija. I'm Peja. 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 And that you, you're Pay Payma. Pay ma. Pay ma. <laughs> yeah. And then, oh, it's a me. Pay ma. I'm Pay ja. I'm Pay ja. Wait, and it's a Pay ma. Wait, Pay ja. wait, wait, wait. That's not the end of the Star Wars name. Yeah. And then for your last name, it is the first two letters of your mother's maiden name and then the first three letters of your father's last name. First three letters of our dad's last name. Okay. So so my name was M's Pomic Will. M's Pomic Will? Oh, that's, Ew. That's nice. I kind of like that. Mine's Pay ja Ator. Yeah. Ator. Ator. Ator with three T's. Three T's. O T T T O R. You can't get more alien than that. That's very Star Wars. Yeah. Or. Or. Hell yeah, that's cool. And this is good because your name sounds similar now, so it's like, oh yeah, you were brothers in this galaxy far, far away. Peja and Pema. Or. You're from like Batu or somewhere. Yeah, probably. Is some, that the Asian desert planet? planet. <laughs> no. Which one is that Which planet with, that the, with the Asian with diplomats? Batu is the new pl- that Batu is the new planet they made up for. That's where uh, Galaxy's Edge is the, in Disneyland. Oh Ooh. yeah. So like when you go when you uh it, what it's like Black Spire Outpost mm-hmm. on the planet Batu. Right. That and has uh, Jacka in it or whatever. What I I don't remember the name of anything. What? Who's what? Who's Lupita? No. What's, what's no, her character's no, 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 name? No, 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 uh, uh, Mas Kanata. No, it's not. It, it, it's not that. No, it's <laughs> sounds like a car. Yeah. type it sounds like a car brand. Zero percent APR financing. The new Maz Kanata. She's not there. Like a rock. <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> so fucking no, stupid. They literally just created this planet in the past like few years, uh, just, just just because that's where the 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 land in Disneyland is got set. it they just want it yet yeah, and so it's, it's, it's where all the Wado creatures are from it's called Ashkenaza, <laughs> Ashkenaza. <laughs> <laughs> that's that that's the home uh, world of the Toydarians yeah. <laughs> oh my god has anybody called George Lucas out on yes this stuff? all the time Dude, what is he like, how does he like respond in person yeah in person like in an interview and does oh, he, if I mean, so, does he get defensive about it? Yeah, like, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah surely yeah. he must. Yeah, but he has does. anybody literally gone up to him and been like, what you did was kind of racist, dude? Probably. Yeah, definitely. And then do we have documented footage of him responding to this? Because um, I, everybody makes these jokes, and I'm like, I've never seen like video footage of like, you know, like Quentin Tarantino slapping the cameraman outside the coffee house it's like where somebody just corners George Lucas and they're like what you like you just had like basically a Chinese stereotypes and black stereotypes and Jewish stereotypes and George Lucas is like what are you filming right now 
No, no, no. What are you filming? Let me see your camera. Yeah. <laughs> his <laughs> voice just, is Quentin Tarantino's. Yeah, he's just Quentin Tarantino. <laughs> All right, let me see what you're filming right now, okay? Okay, because well, you're kind of invading my personal space. And, All right, uh, listen here, buddy. I'm trying but to I could leave... kick your ass up and down this street if I wanted to. Also, okay? George Lucas no, is, gonna... is more reclusive, <laughs> and he's just like an older man. <laughs> and so... Just on his ranch. He just... doesn't like invite it upon himself the way <laughs> like true. most... The way just like other celebrities do. I would I love, love to him, see like, just like <laughs> just like Clint Eastwood style, just like riding a dewback on his ranch. Yeah, he's just right. like with a rifle, just like firing at people. He's like, get off my land. There's like video footage. Did you footage. know that Jar Jar Binks was kind of racist? <laughs> <laughs> Shoot, literally shooting lasers yeah. at the paparazzi. I hear one more word out of your mouth. Just trying to enjoy my coffee. <laughs> <laughs> it's a huge cup of coffee. A and a huge coffee maker on it. <laughs> I'm trying to live out the rest of my days in peace. Yeah. We made red tails. I thought it was going to be the return of old Georgie Bullhead, but people shunned it. I'm not going to do anything anymore. Didn't he? He was going to do any movies, right? That, he that's said he was going to do like a Coppola thing. Yeah. And by that, does he mean Indiana Jones movies? <laughs> uh, Indiana Jones. <laughs> well, no, his name's Indy. No, I know, but I still. Don't listen, guys. I'm not firing at all. Indie films. All cylinders. cylinders. Sick. He is Cut sick. Matt some slack. Yeah. Yeah. You don't have to cut P- me any pretend slack, Pretend all of his jokes are like 30% better than they are. Yes. Because that's where he <laughs> yeah. normally be. Yeah. <laughs> if you could do me that kindness. <laughs> this is all... This is, remember, uh, and, and so, again, as you can tell, because we've been on topic the entire time, this episode yeah. is about the movie Tune In Tomorrow. We went off on a tangent because I was talking about DVDs. Is it and like backs? Best Buy. <laughs> on be- at Best Buy and how we got like the Peter Falk collection is was the way to buy this movie. Yo, yes, Peter Falk's in the movie. Is it because yeah. Dubax lick the dew off of their backs? Isn't because they live in the desert. They, I don't their know. Their tongues go out that far and like wrap around. I don't know, head. man. I remember I had a book of like the animals from the different planets. Yeah. And but they don't tell you cool how, how like George Lucas named them. They just yeah. tell you about their life cycle. You know, you right. They tell you about like the, the biology yeah. of, of these fictional animals. There's these spiders on Dagobah that turn into trees. Whoa. Do you know about that? No, I don't. <laughs> Matt, tell us more. Hey, that's pretty cool, Matt. Yeah. Okay, so <laughs> nice. welcome to our podcast. Within <laughs> a pod- that. Because welcome to our podcast within a podcast, uh, Matt's Star Wars Corner. Yeah. Matt. Oh, here we go. Okay. Um, <laughs> oh, no. Um, <laughs> Matt, tell us, tell us some more about just like the, you know, w- was it like the various... I don't know, like the species, uh, yeah, just, some, just like the wildlife in this galaxy far, far there's away. There's some Tatooine flora and fauna information, if you will. S- some biomes. Yeah. Um, there are... Uh... What do you think, buddy? <sighs> oh. <they're... laughs> <laughs> On Coruscant, yeah. there's these slugs that live in the lower... Because the, the city's... Um, it's a planet. Planet. <laughs> Planet's a city. It's one and the same as multi. There's multi tiers, obviously, and the rich get to live, you know, on the top layers of the of the planet and see yeah. and see the sun. But deep in the core, it's all slimy, but it's all technology. So it's slime technology, and so there's, there's slugs these, that live well, there. Well, no, there's just these slugs that feed on the power cables. They're like minox, but they're slugs. Not bad. All right, that's and the end of that segment. That that was Matt Star. That was Matt Star Wars <laughs> Corner. Uh, thanks for joining us. Also, I think we're done with that segment. If anyone listening wants to look forward to further installments, <laughs> if anyone listening wants to wants to make us a little uh, jingle or theme song for that, no, don't make a jingle. It'll for definitely Matt. return in future episodes. I'm here <laughs> to give you info vaguely remembered from when I was nine. <laughs> if you just go on your computer and Google it yourself, you'll get I'm better Wikipedia. info. <laughs> Don't listen to Matt now. And just me, like I think I was horny for that one Twi'lek dancer. <laughs> <laughs> You're just talking about like half remembered boners yeah. from ages ago. Yeah. <laughs> I think a decade back I was a little bit half masked when I was watching that scene. Yeah, I don't know, but yeah. even even uh, size noodles could get it. I feel like. I mean, th- those lips, <laughs> those lips, and that tube mouth. Yeah, size noodles. DSLs, right? Talk about yeah. DSLs. Talk about DSLs. Digital single lens reflex. Um. Anyway, uh, uh, can I? Okay. Yeah. I'm let's... going to read <laughs> the paragraph plot summary from Wikipedia because we have to get this on the rails. We have to. <laughs> Ugh. <laughs> All right, tune in tomorrow. Let's talk about it. Okay. Let's do it. Yeah. Martin Loader. <laughs> that's Keanu's name. <laughs> <laughs> Matt's dying. You all know what Matt's thinking about and why he's laughing. <laughs> yes, you do. No. <laughs> okay. Martin Loder uh, works at a local radio station mm. that just hired a new script writer, Pedro Carmichael. Yes. That's 
Peter Falk. Yeah. Big Peter Falk. Martin's Aunt Julia, uh, not related by blood, that is Barbara Hershey. Important. Retur- not related by blood. Yeah. 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 It's, what's it? it's like his, his like father's mother's uh, like husband's sister. sister. Yeah, yeah, something like that. Something Wait, like his father's that. mother's husband is just his father? <laughs> <laughs> that accidentally <laughs> took it back to actual incest. It's like... <laughs> Horse, like, it's the horseshoe theory of incest. It's like <laughs> mother's brother's husband's sister. Yes, yeah. Something yeah. like that. Anyway, she returns home after many years away and Martin falls for her. Once Pedro finds out about this romance, he starts incorporating details of it into the script of his daily radio drama series. Soon, Martin and Julia are not only hearing about their fictional selves over the radio, but they hear about what they are going to do next. So this is... This movie I found it's um, based on a book. Uh, yes, well, the, the surrounding story of it I find really interesting because it's based on a book by uh, Mario Vargas Yoga or something like that. Yep, Yorga, Yorga, Yorga. Uh, oh, Mario Vargas Yosa. Yosa, sorry. It's a, My it's bad. a novel from uh, published in Spain in 1977, and interestingly, it's set in Peru. Yep, it's called not- Julia and the Scriptwriter. Terrible yeah. name for a book. Apparently, though, it was pretty well received. I know that he is like, he's one of these writers who I'd been meaning to read for a while. I think there's a book called Conversations in the Cathedral that I meant to have uh, read at some point. But anyway, he's always been on like the back of my mind. So I I actually, you know, I found that out after watching the movie. Um, Yeah. And that already surprised me. But it sort of also made sense then, like, it, it put some of the puzzle pieces into place concerning like, kind of what seemed like it's a pretty star-studded movie there's a lot of like people that are just like well-established character actors and com- like comedic actors and well, stuff so, in this. okay that specifically i think we should explain because uh and, and apparently the novel has more of this format mm-hmm. where uh because uh pedro peter fox character yeah. writes the this daily radio serial because it's set in like the 30s the 50s i believe the, the, the 50s yeah that late oh wow I think in Lima, in Lima, Peru, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but so loosely based off of Mario is the own author's life? own life. Wait, are there TVs in this movie? No, then I, I don't think it would be the 50s because yeah. then, then you'd see TVs. That's a really good point. That is a good point. Well, uh, you know what? 37, <laughs> 37, 15. No, <laughs> my, my sweet baby. <laughs> it's. It's gross and people don't like it. You murdered my child. <laughs> um, for everyone wondering, Matt Burpt and I have cut it out so you didn't hear it. Um, but I think that I'm going to say this is the 30s. Yeah, I think so. Okay, uh, but <laughs> uh, b- but the way it goes is uh, every like these this daily serial radio drama is very popular. Uh, right. It, it's like this, this, you know, melodrama with cliffhangers and stuff like what that. Was it Secrets of the Garden District? Yeah. Something like that? And so... That's the name of the ongoing radio show. And so but what they do is uh, they dramatize, like, like cinematically, these radio dramas. Yeah. Uh, and voice so, actors, Foley artists, and, you got and, everybody. Well, well, no, I, well, there's like an I, I alternate mean, like, reality. Like, the, the film will, like, portray, yes, like, cinematically... Yes, yes, yeah. Uh, the actual radio drama and then yeah. I think it's kind of clever the way it'll like cut back to the studio where it's uh, people you know a bunch of kind of you know frumpy. Like, a bunch of frumpy like 50 year olds and then, I, then like a Foley guy like with all these like like various contraptions to make the sound effect all gathered around and they're you know as opposed to the the beautiful uh you know people right, in, in, like yeah. on location for these these sequences but so they'll have these parts where it'll just turn into like, oh, the, the, these sections where it'll just be the, you know, the fictional radio drama. Exactly. And then it'll go back to reality. And apparently in the book, uh, I did a little bit of research, um, it actually alternates chapters between the reality and then the radio drama. And are you supposed to fill in the blanks for each chapter? As in, when it cuts back to reality after having a chapter about the radio drama? I don't know that much. Well, this seems, but wait, wait, uh, sorry, I, I just wanted to wrap up one point that I was sure. making, just jumping off of a thing that Matt had said. But a lot of the cast of like the these, you know, these other character actors uh, and like pretty well known people that you'll recognize, a lot of them are in 
uh, just like the, the sort of fantasy radio drama sequences. Yeah. They've got like Peter Gallagher coming right off of Sex, Lies, and Video Tape yeah, yeah. as kind of like the dashing romantic lead. Right. Which is also the, the kind of role he played. <laughs> just so they sort of like, you know, old-fashioned romantic lead. Uh, For all you guys who don't know who we're talking about, obviously we we mean maybe pe- the dad from the OC. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so maybe you guys know that better. Or, or also, you know, like one of the stars of Sex, Lies, and Videotape. But then like even in the Hudsucker proxy, yeah. you know, he shows up as just the really, in like one scene as the dashing singer at like this ball. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, it's, it's, Peter Gallagher had that very kind of old school charm he's got that striking he's got that those like those striking features and the that like best eyebrows in the game the, the eyebrows it's just the eyebrows obsidian black eyebrows you wouldn't just expect eyebrows to be so night. yeah effective until yeah. you just see what they can he's do dashing and he has he's he has hair that was meant to be like pressed back with very very styled with brill gel and brill cream yeah <laughs> dapper yeah. dan just well Dude, oiled keanu's keanu's looks in this movie are pretty great. Strong looks. He's, he's got some good hell, he's got yeah. some good looks throughout the movie. Yeah. And his hair is plastered to his head yeah. and so oh, yeah. shiny. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's the shiniest I it's I've ever seen. To it. touch it. But, but I, I will say like like the rest of the cast of like the fantasy radio drama. Yeah. You've got people like John Larroquette and Elizabeth McGovern and in a little crossover, we have Buck Henry, mm-hmm. writer of The Graduate who also appeared in and co-wrote the Josh Hartnett film, Town and Country. That's right, as Buck. Father Seraphim. We know what you did, Buck. Yeah. We're some of the only people out there that know what you did. What you, with the poo-poo you made. Yeah, you made a big poo-poo <laughs> you made in 1999. Messy, didn't you? <laughs> really and waste a lot of people's time and money, didn't you? Yeah, and yeah. most have forgotten, but we have not forgotten. Yeah, never forget. We're going to carry that torch <laughs> with us. You, never forget. You wrote and then acted in a little bit and starred in Town and Country. One of the the worst movies. Not cool, dude. And, and this movie's not, not cool. good either. <laughs> <laughs> I will say, this is no Town and Country. No, 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 no. no, no, no. no. Again, because I, I think we all agree, Town and Country is a movie. That... It's the Dark Crystal of our podcast. It's just like pure evil, and oh, it's energy oh. reverberates. I thought you meant the movie Jake, Dark the Dark Crystal. Crystal Jake, the Dark Crystal is not evil, though. The, our Dark Crystal is corrupted by the Skeksis. It's actually the heart of Thra. Nah, you're right. You're right. <laughs> all right. <laughs> all right. Sorry. So we right. chill with that shit. I, 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 I was out of bounds. With yeah, that one. you Dark were Crystal out of, is you're actually way out just what holds the, the world together. But Ooh. what what I just <laughs> wanted to say yeah, yeah. Go for it. here. Oh yeah. Uh, Town and Country obviously yeah. is is a vile, reprehensible film with n- no redeeming qualities. No. That from from the very beginning of that project was cursed, was <laughs> evil. Yeah, uh, and this is a movie that I can totally see see a version of it working. Yes, I, this definitely. movie was like a charming. In my head, like it was bad, and I didn't really like it. But I will say that like the overall what like. The taste of my mouth after, like, having seen it is not bad. It's, like, a charming failure. Like, well, it, okay, I have a whole... It's, it's hard thought. to hate. It's really hard to hate. It's not yeah. a hateable movie. Because it, it's going... Um, I mean, Town and Country was also a movie... By the way, for new listeners, Town and Country, we covered it on our previous season. It's one of Josh Hartnett's early films. It's a Warren Beatty starrer... Uh, that cost about the same as the movie Gladiator. Yeah. <laughs> and, it, and instead, it's just about a bunch of old people fucking each other. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Town and Country. Sorry, so funny. Town and Country is the only movie that we've ever encountered, fellow listeners, that we agree is a pure a movie made of pure evil, essentially. Yeah. Uh, built on the fucking Indian burial ground of just bad intentions. <laughs> bad intentions. And, yeah. yeah. And Dust so, fuckers. so th- this is not that. This is yeah. this is um this is a movie where you you know it, it's just okay. So the, the general thrust of this movie is you know Keanu is the, is this young guy. He's twenty one. He works at this radio station. He's an up and coming hotshot in the radio station. Exactly. He writes scripts for them. And but then he falls for his hot aunt immediately. Yeah. Um, yeah. And she I'm assuming there one. were some like pre existing feelings that were like confirmed. Which, there's a lot of like. Because I'm sure this novel is much longer and goes into great detail about the relationships between everybody, but yeah. in the movie, one of the he- big weaknesses is that like the emotional crux that moves the whole thing forward, which is a problem in a lot of other movies that we've seen, like is is so flimsy, and the foundations are built so poorly early on that when you're supposed to follow these characters then into like the plot twists and turns of third, second, third acts, right? You're already not. On board. And, you and didn't he, get on board the boat. And even though a big theme is <laughs> yeah. like, you know, life imitating art and vice versa and how they bleed into each other until they're kind of like 
emerged a single the Venn diagram merges into a circle basically at the end it still doesn't really like so there's like this there's a lot of melodrama it's more melodramatic in the fictional written world that Peter Fox character ends up making than in the real world where the there real are world like is mostly a comedy just like kind of like a wacky comedy so it's like but like yeah. it's like melodrama comedy and like wacky ro- romance comedy and the, the two tones meld a bit but i don't know what how to describe it. there's just like this dissonance there exactly well, the, the, okay yeah we're getting at, at sort of my whole take on this movie okay uh and and you're right his whole like falling for aunt julia is flimsy yeah uh, because it's like she shows back up and then he's like oh hey we should like go to a movie right and she's then, doing this whole like uh what Catherine hepburn kind of thing right and then she doesn't show up and then he's like i really i really wanted you to come the to nerve the movie. Of this i like, actually really like you yeah and uh yeah it happens very suddenly yeah um as and, uh, does the arrival of peter falk He's like almost like a Professor McMonkey McBean character, <laughs> yeah. if you will. McMonkey McBean character. He's a McBean if you will. type. <laughs> he uh, he comes in after having clearly what they set up at the very beginning. There's a prologue uh, set six months earlier. He's like kind of a. They make it's. He's honestly like an accidental terrorist. He's like a criminal. Yeah, he, but he, it's because he's such a pure artist. But the, and that's kind no. of the joke. <laughs> he's almost like a mythic character. Though. I like him though. The thing is that I like his like destructive nature. Like I think that comedy element could really work. It's just that he is failed by like the surrounding story, which I think in the book probably works fairly well because it's based on again the original source materials author's experiences. Right. So like, but. Okay, you know, I, like he really, he genuinely had a semi incestuous love, like 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 for an aunt. Well, look, and like I, this weird alcoholic like writer guy was like this kind of um, weird synergistic muse with him at the so, radio station. So Mario Vargas Llosa was he was in this case Martin Loder is also, closer to his yeah. personal experience. Guys, okay, should I be back him. Up. I was wrong. This movie what? is set in 1951. Oh. Bra! So in New Orleans still... But you know what? TVs hadn't totally caught on yet. It wasn't a household appliance. Patrick was wrong. People were saying, do you know what I'm saying to you? Patrick so is wrong. wrong. Um, he was more like Martin Loder in real life. Mario Vargas Llosa. Okay, so the author who wrote the source material, he, he was the young guy, the Keanu Reeves character, involved with this semi-by-law incestuous relationship with his own aunt. My my problem isn't that so much. I, I get that he's drawing from personal experience, but I didn't fully understand, as much as I like Peter Falk and I think he's the funniest part of the movie, yeah. his character also fundamentally is just so strange and didn't make sense to me. I didn't know what kind of movie you could hang around this particular character. I think there were some choices made that were not set up properly well, that were in the book. Well, take the prologue, for example. Which is, uh, I'm looking take at it right David now. David Lynch's Dune. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay. So yeah. The prologue is two and a half minutes long and is actually, it's a pretty interesting setup. Yeah. Sure. You also, you don't see, you don't even see his face. Well, they're clearly like excited that they got Peter Falk to do the role. Right. Yeah. <laughs> they're like, oh boy, can't wait to show him to everybody. <laughs> He's kind of like Orson Welles in The Third Man. They like yeah, kind of like tease yeah. him for a we while got him. before he they, before the reveal of him. Right. Like, imagine, yeah. but imagine oh. instead of a role that's incredibly worthy of his talents in a classic. Yeah. It's a basically intentionally forgotten movie you can't even find except maybe on DVD on the Peter Falk DVD collection yeah, the at Peter Best Buy. Yeah, trilo- <laughs> weird trilogy. But Jake, you want to talk about the prologue? Yeah. So the prologue opens up. And you, we don't see Peter Falk's face, but he's working away at a new script at in, a different radio in station. In Detroit. In Detroit. He's working away at a new script for the, the latest episode of whatever radio play they're about to do. Um, and he's typing furiously. And everyone else, though, at this radio station is running around in a panic because they just received a package that's obviously a bomb. And you can hear it ticking comically. Well, well the, the uh, I think the station manager gets a phone yeah, call a saying right. that there's a bomb. There's yeah. a bomb in their building. And everybody in this building seems to have this understanding. It's not fully revealed to you as a person watching the movie right. yet. But they seem to know that Be Peter Fox this. sitting at his desk typing the screenwriter, or typing the script, 
has something to do with this. And they're like, we knew this was going to happen eventually. God damn you. Yeah. And Peter Falk is like, I'm not done with my script. He's like, the whole building's going to blow. We just got a phone call that there's a bomb in here. And if you're not going to step out, then you can accept your own fate, whatever. And so everybody runs out of the building. Peter Fox still there because he's a true artist. And you, right. But so you, you only see him from the back. Yeah, he's just and typing he's away. still working. Everyone he's kind of like is, a Johnny Cash. He looks like Johnny Cash. He does. Like Johnny Everyone's just fleeing the for their lives. And he's just this guy just hunched over this typewriter, yeah. still working. And then the building explodes. The building explodes right as he hits, like, you know, the, the keyboard is that satisfying ring and the, the top post slides over to the right again. And then uh, everybody's standing outside. They think he's dead. And you see Peter Falk, like, walk out of the cellar somehow. Mm-hmm. And then... And then Trapes away into the night without being seen Down by anybody alley. else, and then it cuts to New Orleans six months later. Right, so and he's Peter Falk is basically a hundred percent responsible for the destruction of a Detroit radio station. But you, you don't know why, or you're not even sure that's true at the beginning. You, yeah, you don't know that that's true. You do find out that it is true. <laughs> and, yeah, <laughs> and that he is essentially this guy who travels. What seems like you, the movie gives you the impression that this has happened before and it will happen again. Again, he's like this mythic figure traveling yeah. America who is <laughs> so who writes the most compelling stories that everyone listens to and can't get enough of. But also, he like courts controversy and right. whips up a frenzy. But he's but only with Albanians. <laughs> well, no, 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 no. This is what's so weird about this no, character. You, I don't like it. No, Jake, you're wrong. Well, you're not wrong that he that Al, the Albanian jokes are so funny. <laughs> They're not funny. Shut, yeah, well, okay, are, are, are you guys, offended by Albanian jokes? I'm not I, offended by them. I just they all landed flat. Like, I, I just did not laugh at a single. Are one you of kidding them. me? I laughed more every time <laughs> it was brought up. I okay. am half and half between you guys, but I'll bring it up in a sec, Matt. What you're going to say? But why, why is Jake wrong? Yeah. Oh, because... Well, explain what the premise is before you explain why I'm wrong, because nobody knows. Uh, Peter Falk writes basically an entire radio show and constantly inserts uh, like slanderous in-jokes about Albanians the entire time. Well, and, no, and he okay. keeps pushing those into the, the screenplays for no apparent reason. Well, there is... Peter Falk... Again, I haven't read the book, but in the movie, Peter Falk is a... I think just a sort of almost magical realism because that's part of the same sort of Latin American He's school yeah. you know because like I get Gabriel Garcia Marquez I get Marquez confused yeah. with Mar- Mar- oh really yes by the way I'm, like I am Marquez looking at the book this is based on around. you can you can just like it's it's in print you know he's an incredibly you they're just, both so famous there's like a cool cover it's like here on amazon for uh 19 bucks Ooh, they didn't he a, win like the nobel prize for literature like he's like one of really? the yes. biggest ex- liter- literary exports from you know south america like he's huh. yeah I, it's funny i feel like i haven't heard of him. Yes, I, I haven't heard of him you were saying yeah so i imagine just again based on like the idea that this was a book which did change my perspective that effectively handled i think he's supposed to be this sort of magical realist figure because i think they're out of that sort of genre of writing as was marquez right okay uh where there's where the whole idea is like these fantastical things happen that represent real life things where you're not supposed to be sure if it's real or not. You know what I mean? Like that's the whole idea of magical realism really crudely put. And I think Peter Falk is like the satirical representation of an artist in general, but in particular a writer. Like like, like, he's always in these, like these these crazy disguises. Yeah. He like, I mean, uh, he's constantly dressing up. He's like always like frenzied. He's super neurotic. And he like, has all these dumb made up rules that he claims help him become motivated. And one of them is making up fake beefs with, with like ethnicities. Yeah. So he even chose Albanians for that particular run. And then remember at the very end, he's like, no, I love that. I'm part Albanian. I love Albanian. Like, I'm half Albanian. I'm half care? Albanian myself. Yeah. He's like, but the, right Nor- the but the Norwegians. Yeah. And he's just like, you need like a fake arbitrary enemy to but, like give so you he's, anger. He's, he's, he's just uh, stoking the like like a new controversy each time. But his right. new controversy is For always race or ethnic related, which is what was weird to me. It was very specific. Like yeah. he's like an artist always needs something to push against or something that fuels their anger, and I'm like. What if, like, the, what if like, what was, is he gonna choose, like, black people, like, at some point, at some or point. like Chinese yeah. people? Yeah, like, but, but he's we're all laughing into- now because it's like Albanians, Norwegians, like, okay, they're Scandinavian, like, not a big deal. But it's just like it was strange to me that like a whole aspect of Peter Falk's character is that he, because he's an artist and he needs, I guess, this sense of feeling angry at something in order to get him to write, which was but just confusing it, to me, anyway. And it also creates this just environment of chaos. Yeah, where right. like, now there is a consequence to it, which I think. Uh, counteracts 
some of the like problems with if they just let that slide entirely. Like it yeah. is the whole thing that like makes him basically a, a man on the run kind of criminal. Yeah. Which, also, which is kind of funny because, you know, everyone else is just having this sort of like a uh, like romantic comedy storyline. And then he's there like just and like the creating in the background, you know, you have people like almost like riots starting and yeah. like, like, like violent threats the, like, and like protests outside the building the, every like, single day. And Al- Albanian liberation front or something. Liber- yeah. Liberation front. And shit. Okay, okay. Here's my thing about what I, what I think is funny and what is not funny about the Albania stuff. Uh-huh. Right. It's I a th- huge part of this movie. I think in general, the, uh, the stuff happening in like real life with like the, uh, you know, p- the station manager being like, stop making these Albanian jokes and, and, and like the various uh, yeah. Albanian protesters. I don't think that stuff is especially funny. What I do think is funny is in those uh, kind of fantastical <laughs> scenes where, the, where, where they, they visualize the radio plays and then you have these like big romantic melodramas right. and then people will still just keep like forcing in these Al- disses of Al- yeah. <laughs> of Albania. That is and, true. And those are so shoehorned in. It's as if like this writer is like writing this really good, exciting stuff, but then he has this, he cannot let go right. of this, this grudge against the Albanian people. I will, and and I will, when you have like, you know, Peter Gallagher, like, like, you know, clutching Elizabeth McGovern, right. and like, like you delivered in this romantic dialogue and then still like trashing Albania in the middle of it. Yeah. That, to me, those were the funniest things in the movie. Yeah, that's yeah. true. I will, I will admit just like stuff time. like I want to clutch you closer than an, an Albanian clutches the goat he has sex with because he's a <laughs> subhuman like <laughs> creature. Yeah, I mean, sure. I, I I think I agree with you. It is what's what's funny is the way that his character like essentially needs to shoehorn those ideas, like those jokes and one liners, into a script at the at the cost of derailing the plot that he's created that everybody seems to love. Okay. Can I give you my take on this movie? Yeah, sure. My whole main take that I figured out as, as, as I was watching Lay it. Lay it on right. chief. Okay, so this movie is set in 1951. Mm-hmm. I think what this movie wants to be, and I think a, there would be a better version of this movie, if this had been a screwball comedy made in the 50s, directed by, like, Preston Sturgis. And okay. uh, I think it has all the elements of that, not just the setting, but just the whole sort of thing of, like, it has this kind of, like, this uh, screwball secret romance. This, yeah. th- th- this young guy at this radio station who's supposed to be like managing this crazy writer, you know, falls in love with his aunt, but they have to keep it a secret. But then also the crazy writer is like manipulating their relationships so that he can, he get, can get material for his controversial but very popular radio dramas. Right. Like all the stuff is. Uh, is right there, and every so often there'll there'll be a scene that will like be presented in this sort of classic like Hollywood screwball comedy kind of way. Um, but then I don't think they they stick with that tone enough. No. But you can see like uh, I would I was just watching this movie and I would just be watching these scenes, but then imagining like okay how would this look in black and white with uh, the more classical kind of like. You know, nineteen like forties, fifties sort of framing the mm-hmm. way the way scenes were directed back then. Uh, have the performances be a bit bigger, the the, the dialogue a bit faster and sharper. Yeah, and, uh, at least for some of the characters. I don't know Peter Falk no, no, needs no, to no, go broader. No, no. Peter <laughs> Falk, you could basically just keep as he is. Yeah, he does not need to tone it uh, any higher than he <laughs> right. already has it. But I th- I think this is a movie that like it. It really, like, uh, you can tell it was an inspiration, but they really should have been chasing that classic kind of, of Hollywood screwball comedy. Because I, I think that's, like, the main inspiration. And I think a better version of this movie would be one that was, like, made back then. I bet you there's also... I don't have any follow-up to this because, again, haven't read the source material because I think literary adaptations are, you know, merit their own sort of different perspective on a film you're watching. I think it just changes things. Mm -hmm. And so I bet you like this weird idea to shift it, put it in a tone of like a 50s screwball comedy, but also shift it to new Orleans. When I guarantee you there's some heavily like culturally like Chilean stuff in there for, from the time period and also humor that like, cause I know that there were other instances in the movie where they, would just steal or not steal, but like adapt things like word for word or like people's names and all that kind of stuff. So I'm just wondering if there's like this kind of misapplied literal adaptation of certain parts of the book. And then the creative licenses they took 
just didn't mix well and you get something that um yeah just feels right loose and and just kind of inconsequential and or, like or something is lost in translation oh, from shifting yeah, the book yeah. over literally to, lost in translation yeah. so I, I was thinking about how this should be like uh, a, a, like a 1940s screwball comedy right at this at, at a point when the movie did a thing that would never happen in a movie back then, and I was like, oh, this is a, an exact example of where it like misses the tone. Which is what? There's this scene where Keanu's father has discovered this illicit affair he's having <laughs> with his aunt and shows up and just at, like at his job at night and just starts right. choking him. And like, and it's this very intense, it's like, like, yeah. like dramatic scene where he like threatens him and, Stop and he, fucking your aunt. <laughs> starts yeah. choking him. I'll kill but, you and bury you. And, and right there. And I'm like, no, this scene shouldn't be in the movie. There should be a scene where like, it's like at Keanu's parents' house and maybe she snuck in and then they have to like hide her, uh, you know, uh, comically like, behind some curtains. Exactly. She puts a lampshade over her head. They should be chasing head. each other around a dinner table. He's like throwing mashed potatoes yeah, at him. Dun, dun, right. Dun, 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 like dun. You, you, how could you do such a thing? You big yeah, idiot. Yeah. What is your brain made of mashed exactly. potatoes? Exactly. He shouldn't be like what, this. A simple. He shouldn't be this like <laughs> violent, abusive father. Suddenly, I'm like, it's the same thing where it's like Fred Ward when he threw the like radiator at his wife in Prince of Pennsylvania. <laughs> right. It's like, hey, 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 hey. This is a comedy. This is a comedy. We were what trying to keep the light around here. Don't strangle your son to death in a dark room. Yeah, you committed the taboo of in. Incest. It's like, yeah. whoa, okay. But that's I the, mean, no, no. That's the thing. It, it, We're it, making a joke of it right now, aren't we? Yeah. I think it, <laughs> it gets closer to the tone it should have, usually at the radio station. Well, when, when they're there. Yeah, my favorite parts are the the fake fantasy world of the story that you get to go in filmically. And then honestly, it's like Peter Falk interacting with the like radio players there, like all the actors. Yeah. Like he tells one guy to jerk off in order to like yeah, he's like, oh, he's going to go in the bathroom. Like, I don't jerk believe off. that you love her in this scene. I got a tip for you. Go to the bathroom and jerk off and come back and do your lines again. And you're gonna, it's going to come across as way more real. Yeah. And, and how, like, like, really? You cut in between yeah. the, like, fantasy and the reality of the in-studio people acting, but the, like, VO is them doing the, like, handsome young people voices, but they're all these, like, 55-year-old, like, kind of frumpy. Yeah, yeah these schlubby You know, like, characters. radio people. Yeah. And then, like, honestly, more stuff with that old quavery old foley artist guy yeah. i wanted more gags where he had to do all this kind of crazy shit and making it rain and stuff like I that. Did, he didn't like, even have lines but he was making me laugh because he's just all old and looking all like bewildered at, like trying to keep up i did like that before peter falk's character shows up and sort of revitalizes the radio station he like barely has any props like I, the only thing he has is like a teacup that he can rattle yeah. a little <laughs> bit on a plate and then when uh, Peter Falk shows up and like rejuges the whole storyline and mm -hmm. then makes it a lot more exciting and dynamic, you also see he give, gives the Foley artist a bunch of props to use. He has like that metal sheet that he can wave to make thunder and stuff. And he's he has like a whole contraption of horns and bells and stuff strapped to his body suddenly. He has like a thing that he can only honk by reaching out and biting it with his mouth. So uh, one question is, his name is Pedro Carmichael? Or was yep. Uh, yes. He... Yes. He clearly has a reputation that precedes him. Yeah. Is he coming... So, like, I guess the taint of the the other radio station he was per formerly employed at exploding doesn't follow him. That doesn't follow him. Also, so, you know, so there's that. He still has his name out there. You'd think he'd be wanted. But secondly... Um, well, again, what crime did he commit? Uh, truly, I guess you're right. In the, it, at the end of this movie, he, he has committed crimes. Yes. Very straightforwardly. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. I my one my one like kind of quibbling question is like, was he hired to um, revamp the existing soap they're doing or to recreate a new one? I that is a forget. good question. I, I've forgotten to already um, because I don't think it really. Do you think it matters? Kind of. If it's one or the other, what would what would change the script if it was the difference between creating his own thing or just um, you know actively adjusting an existing one for the better? I just think like I, don't, I guess it wouldn't really. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Fuck. Well, I'm just gotcha. wondering, like you know, yeah. There is this like there was like initially what seemed to potentially to be this like uh, uh, rivalry that could have happened between him and and like the original scriptwriter from this show that he then gets to kick kick out of the way. Well, I think he he's like I got my own thing. I don't even know if they shit can a pre existing guy that I think it's Keanu. Yeah. Who like? Who is, seems to roll with that pretty well? He hasn't. Yeah, yeah, I, like, he's a, 
he's a really passive character until he's like incredibly headstrong and impulsive. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I, we don't need to. He's he's just yeah, he's a pretty flimsy character. Like I don't know what's going oh, on. Poor Keanu. It's all right. We're not. It's like we said. It's not. This this is this is a totally fine, easy to watch movie, and there's a lot of things in it that you can find to like about it. Like I I did enjoy the premise of the plot and like the some of the devices that were used. Like even even like just right at the beginning when you just get the entire cast credits done, but through classy '50s radio voiceover okay. narration. Wait, yeah. slow down. Like, hey, welcome to this movie. This Tune is in tomorrow. My favorite thing this movie did, yeah. and I've never seen it done before. Yeah, I don't think I. Yeah, I don't think I have either. They. The opening credits are all done auditorially. Yeah, you don't see any text. Yeah, anywhere. it is a radio announcer over a uh, just like a montage of like Keanu driving through town. Yeah, they have a just a radio announcer read out loud all the credits. It's <coughs> like if, it's like a John Amiel <coughs> film. Starring. As if Keanu Reeves' character is hearing his own real life name get said to him while he's driving in the car. Which it's would, like the movie Tune In Tomorrow, starring Keanu Reeves, and Keanu Reeves is like literally sitting in the car like. It's actually, it seems like listening to It's a to very this. clever idea. It gets through the credits faster than it normally would uh, if yeah. they were appearing on screen. But also, it it just like sets this this particular tone for the movie. Uh, you know, the again, m- real for, life bleeding into the meta tone exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, but but it's Metasexual. but it, it's also mm-hmm. it, it's funny. It it turns the the I mean I obsessively like read the opening credits of movies a lot of people just ignore them yeah. but this turns them into just like kind of like almost like a fun stylistic thing yeah, yeah, yeah. like I like right away the movie's beginning I'm like okay I like this little prologue with yep. like the place blowing up Peter Falk is like this you know like mysterious writer and then we jump ahead six months and now you're doing this this great clever thing where you're having yeah. the radio announcer read the opening credits I'm like oh boy and I'm then into it. and then and then Keanu arrives at the radio station and he walks up to this woman and I'm like, oh God, it's at New Orleans. Oh God, oh God, what's going to happen? And then he says his first line and immediately I went, oh, no, no. He's oh, like, hello, no, it's happening. I do declare, dude. <laughs> yeah. oh, I mean, I do declare. And you're like, oh, oh the- no, he's going to flub the whole thing. He, to well, be oh, well. fair, it could have been worse. Is that he- feel right? Yeah, okay, I'll take it. Yeah, it could have been worse. It could always be worse. Yeah, that's true. It's really hard to argue against. But he's also the lead of the movie, and to me, uh, his performance just didn't work. I just, and there were so many times when he's like, he has to deliver some big line, and it just comes out so awkwardly, and and he, he, he just has so much, like a much stronger accent than like anyone else, and it, like I, I laughed in a way I was not intended to laugh multiple times. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just and because I, of his delivery. Because of Keanu's delivery. And I love yeah. Keanu so much. And he's, it just doesn't work. No, so it doesn't. So another thing, another question just about the movie yeah. is like, because I believe that Peter Falk's character, Pedro, is... <laughs> you just love saying Peter Falk is Pedro. <laughs> is basically... Another, like another thing is, is just, like, doesn't, like, just call him something different. You, just because he's called Pedro yeah. in the book... It's not in fucking. Oh yeah, it's yeah, in New Orleans. This is now in New Orleans. Why yeah. did his character Peter Falk is say the clearly, same? Oh, yeah, um, <laughs> it could be an alias. Uh, because I believe that Pedro is essentially a a like you said a sort of magical realist force as opposed to a human being. Really, well, you said it. I didn't say that. I I, I was literally watching this so dumbed down by I think like other problematic things I was thinking about in the script that it didn't right. even occur to me that he could be a magical realist character as in like you could question whether or not his character was like real even or something strange or like that that he he contains like these vaguely supernatural qualities that I wasn't really thinking about like he he changes costumes and like suddenly will show up in places that it's like how did he get from point A to point B to mm-hmm. me the movie was just like playing on such a broad slapstick level I was just like Whatever, they're just like fucking making it up. Like he's just he was in the building with the explosion, then he pops out the basement suddenly, right? Like out of nowhere, you know. He's in one second in a fireman's outfit, and then suddenly he's in like a bishop's outfit from the Vatican, <laughs> like all in the span of a half second. I just was like, they're not even trying to play he, with logic he's, here. He's also in drag. He's in drag a few times, right? He's trying to because he wa- he wants to like he needs to like 
He's doing method acting, essentially. They overdub his voice yeah. when he does women characters. They yeah. just have a female voice overdub over his lips yeah, singing he's essentially it. the T-1000. It's so funny. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But then <laughs> he can just talk like... It's made people. out of liquid metal and really yeah. fast. Uh, please, someone remake Terminator 2, but put but just put Peter Falk in there. Put Peter Falk in there. Can you imagine him yeah. doing like, the Robert Patrick run? Put oh a my Falk God. in it. Put a Falk in it. Put a Falk in it. Make but, him liquid metal. But then you have like this climactic scene yeah. where uh, he is like... The station manager has been like, you know, you have to take all the Albanian references out. There's these people are like threatening violence. We have like protesters yeah. outside. It's a huge Albanian, you know, uh, group that's now a, like a lot of Albanians running around with picket signs outside the radio we, station saying, if you make one more fucking joke about Albanians, we're going to blow up your building and kill all of you. <laughs> yeah. And he's like, Peter, please just don't which, make an Albanian joke. Well, well no, no, he he's like, confirms all the bad things they're saying about Albanians. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Like they, well, Peter Fox says many times in the movie, he's like, oh, they're very humorless. And then, you know, right. like, can't take a joke but the, but in then, the movie. But then the station manager is like, yeah. you have to give Cancel me all your culture. scripts so I can make sure there are no Albanian references. Yeah. And, uh, and he does. He gives them the scripts. He's like, these are great. Perfect. Go ahead. Do it. Yeah. Um, and then as the, the show is starting, yeah. this is like, again, the climactic scene. This is also while he... I'll get to the whole thing with Keanu and, and, and Barbara Hershey and the, the, <laughs> the whole... rest of the movie, the well, huge part of the movie. Yeah. But like what happens with their storyline at this point, like, like cross cut with this. Yeah. I think they do it. Uh, <laughs> what? Yeah. They but, have sex uh, have a yeah. big mutant They do baby. sex together in a car. <laughs> they, yeah. they, they, well, that's the end. Yeah. Sorry. But Spoilers. anyway, but then Peter Falk, because it's like, yeah. he can't bear for his script to, to be, to go on the air with no Albanian insults. Yeah, he can't do he it. He pulls the fire alarm, the building is evacuated, and then he still goes on the air and does all plays all the parts himself. Yep. That's what I mean. He's a, just a creative force. He's not a man. He's a mouth chameleon, yeah. as you said. Yeah, he's a... Yeah, he's a, he's a the chameleon um, of the mouth. A, a chameleon of the throat. The mouth Thank you. <laughs> yeah. And so, and then he... And I've got to say, I was thinking about, for the listeners, I'm like... Are they being thrown off by the fact that the voices don't sound exactly like they usually do? No, they make it the, because they, he can do them. I guess he can. Yeah, sometimes he just always had it within him to just do this entire yeah, show himself. But then he, he does the to. entire final episode. He's a god yeah. on his own because it's his magnum opus. He's Loki and Arden, Thor Arden, all in one. Well, who's the god of artists? Is there a god of art? <laughs> No, there's no God of Art. Is there a, there's a Greek God Dude, of Art. Dude, I can't wait for the new God of Art 2 to come out for PlayStation 4. <laughs> can't wait to run around to with a huge a... paintbrush. And you just... Wait, so the new God of War game, you have like a son, right? Yeah, he's, yeah. <laughs> he becomes the God of Art. Wouldn't it be cool if the whole time you're like God of War is like, son, you're going to become the new God of War. And he's like, no, father, I want to paint. And then at the end, <laughs> my he... lute and lyre shall be my weapons. I will dance in the, as the God of Art. <laughs> I want to sing. Yeah. But then over the course of the game, you you learn to accept that your son has a path of his own. Yeah. And then there's a spinoff game called God of Art. And it's just a painting simulation. Yeah, it's like Bob Ross, but you're Kratos for some reason. And you're just like color painting by the numbers and your son's like no you need to learn how to blend properly i don't understand i'm sorry why why son i can't i can't do kratos's voice why am i trying to do jake be kratos Kratos. it's like trying to do vin diesel it's like boy it's boy no you had a good the first yeah uh, it gets nah, worse. I'm losing it no 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 this is not a good one my voice is nowhere near deep enough to to do that no, Jake. Could, you're, uh, you're trying a Kratos voice, but when we ask no, no, you to I do have, John Leguizamo, you won't do it. No, no. I have. Here's the thing. I haven't played this game, so I don't know what Kratos sounds like. I'm I'm just doing a deep voice. Yeah, I mean that's, that's it. That's see, the best. See, John Leguizamo. I I feel self conscious about because I, I've never seen Ice Age. Yeah, I know. Okay, we've what been the over the this. I know we've been Our over this. First and we did an episode. You yeah. know what his voice sounds and Pat, like. We've also been over this. You did see Ice Age, okay? <laughs> Everyone saw Everyone Ice Age. Saw, even if you don't remember, it is in your you subconscious. You did see it though. You know what I saw? I Ice saw. Age. I saw the trailers to Ice Age where they just have that rat thing, like the almost squirrel. dying. The squirrel. The Arctic squirrel. Yeah. 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 I saw those trailers. I've Always never. I have never seen an Ice Age film. I can. I. Is, is Ray Romano the, He's the Mastodon? Mammoth. Yeah, the Mastodon. Yeah. Dabra. And then, um, what's his name? Dennis Leary is the Sabretooth Tiger. What a weird cast. Yeah, I'm an God asshole. Damn. Yeah, he was the... Uh, it's fucking weird. The Sabretooth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Think about that. Dennis Leary, John Leguizamo, and Ray Romano in a booth. <laughs> Running around, hanging out, prehistoric times, the Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're the three actors that kids love the most. Yeah, yeah. 
you know, you, you think, okay, who, what stars do like the seven year olds love? <laughs> it's like you got your Disney Channel stars, yeah. and then you got they love Dennis, Dennis Leary. Leary. <laughs> they love kids Dennis love Leary. Dennis Leary. <laughs> kids love Dennis Leary. Kids they were love... flocking to the Spawn movie because they love Leguizamo. Spawn. <laughs> Spawn. <laughs> That's not bad, dude. That is not bad. It's not bad. So uh, my main question about like the confluence between when Peter Fall comes in and this whole like incest relationship. Yeah. Um, is, and this is my defense of him being, you know, at once a, I think real person that exists in the world of this movie and also like a kind of supernatural figure um, is when he arrives Keanu is clearly interested in his aunt. No, no, don't they first meet when he has gone to the movies that we're going to see like a Gene Kelly movie and she doesn't come and then he's all bummed out and then goes to the office, the, uh, the radio station, yeah. and then encounters Peter Falk who he thinks is like a, like a guy, a guy, breaking, a, in a guy breaking in to steal the typewriter. Right, right? yeah. And that's how they first meet. And yeah. you, at first you see his back and you, you, know, you remember him from the... Intro that little so prologue you go, that with the weird guy, the scary guy, <laughs> it's a scary guy. Uh, and, and then uh, he tries to he basically kicks Peter Falk or like punches him, and he falls backwards over a desk. And then Keanu's boss shows up and he's like, "What the heck is going on over here?" This is Pedro. Yeah, and he's like, "This is one of the best script writers in, in town in the entire United States of America." And then Keanu's it's like, the "I guy's didn't a know. legend." Yeah. Uh, so he you know he apologizes and Peter Falk is like kind of mad for a second but then he's like you know what i don't have no i blew up the last radio station i was working at so i i don't have a place well, he's, he's calling their bluff you yeah know? he knows that these stations are hurting yeah. but no this is my actual question he meets keanu in that way yeah keanu is not voicing his incestuous desires and designs on his aunt can you imagine how that, how this went if Peter Fox is like, so kid, what's new with you? He's like, oh man, I want to fuck my hot aunt, I'm but, so, <laughs> but she, she won't let me. I'm Nothing all, much, I'm all but... mixed up inside, man. There's like, I got this aunt and like, she's like related, but like... Wait, 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 excuse me. No, I got this aunt and uh, yeah. she, we're, we're kind of related, How but, do you? That's pretty but good. not by blood. She's hotter than New Orleans on a Tuesday in August. <laughs> I do declare. <laughs> I declare. And that... I feel she would melt in my mouth more like the sweetest softest honeyed butter that you could imagine spreading on a fresh New Orleans roll. <laughs> <laughs> Jake, uh, I mean, this is like your new like voice acting reel right here. Yeah. She's got a pair of lips I would like to kiss and taste sweeter than the, the most Levan powdered sugar on a fresh beignet. <laughs> yes. From the Café du Monde. Yeah. <laughs> In Jackson's Square? Yeah, yeah, just yeah, south of Jackson yeah, Square. I'd um, love to sit her down and just feed her some crawdads. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Until she's choking on them. And, then... and feed her fresh, straight out of the garden okra. <laughs> <laughs> and kudzu vines like a brontosaurus. <laughs> brontosaurus. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I like, I don't know, I like whistle the note with my laugh. You sounded like a train. I sounded like a train. Jacob. I can't even yeah. replicate it. Wow. Oh, listen. Listen. Matt made me whistle like a train. <laughs> Hold on. This is why we were... <laughs> a good choo-choo train. Okay. We're a bad podcast because we don't... I, I'm sorry. We're derailing. Go. <laughs> we're a good podcast. We're derailing Jake the, the choo-choo best. train. <laughs> <laughs> um, Peter Falk, you know, uh, begins to write an incest story. Before, I think, getting the information via Keanu's character that that's like literally what's happening in the world. And yeah. so there is the kind of like miraculous confluence that then Peter Falk like somehow serendipitously realizes that he's got in Keanu an actual person living in the world who is like going through the similar material that he can pull from. I just don't understand where it starts because it, it starts where they're both like Peter Falk arrives just as Julia's arriving and like that romance is ignited and he immediately starts writing about a taboo incest soap opera drama. He, he catches on very quickly. Do you think he's um, perceived that that's what is literally going on or do you think that's an accident and then is like savvy enough to know this is why I think he's kind of fantastical. I don't think it's clear, but I also realize a way that we could that this story could be stronger. Mm-hmm. 
it would be if I think he should be more like a, a bit of a matchmaker and more like get them together, more like convince her to, to yeah. like, like, like to, you know, he, he should meet her and convince her that maybe, maybe uh, Keanu, what, what's Keanu? <laughs> like is he Martin? forces the incest Martin. to happen? Yeah. That he, should be he's like, the matchmaker for incest? I, I, I think so because yeah. it seems like when she eventually relents and goes out with him, it just like, he just kind of like, he already likes her. It's just like yeah. very sudden. And I mean, not that you need like, like a really like elaborate motivation for why is someone attracted to someone else? Yeah. But I, uh, but it's just very sudden. He's just like, I like you. And well, then she's 36 she, years old by her and admission he's 21. In this he's 21. And, and then she, which just, is the bigger age gap than the, the one in the book. Right. She's thick. I think 32 and, he, he's, and he's 18. 18. Yeah. But for, for this is basically a romantic yeah. comedy. Very and similar, I, I just think we need a better like meet cute or a better like spark to that relationship to like, yeah. like what gets them together? What makes her like him? And I think having Peter Falk like manipulate events a little bit more, uh, considering how linked the, the two storylines are throughout the film. Um, I think that would solve some of the problems. Cause he yeah, does I kind of try you. and get them together. Like he does sort of play matchmaker, but it's kind of a little too after the fact. And and at that point, he's just he's just doing it so deviously he can spy on them to like milk material. them for like verbatim dialogue that he records secretly. Yeah, like and a then, weirdo. And then just really transcribes. He doesn't end up actually writing a lot of the plot so much as just transcribing Keanu and Barbara Hershey's conversations. Right. Um, that's all good and fine. Keanu obviously finally catches wind of this and gets pissed off. And then... By just but, hearing one day on the radio just his same words he was saying. Like, literally an argument he had the day before. Yeah. He just hears it suddenly on the radio, and he's like, that son of a bitch, I'll, I'll tell you what. <laughs> he's just Hank Hill. I'll Hank tell Hill. you what, I'll, I'm going to kick your dumb ass. <laughs> and then so he runs back in, and uh, Peter Falk tries to convince him that, like, you know, he's just borrowing this for the sake of the story, but he's like, you know, how is anybody going to know this is your life? I mean, obviously this is good stuff. I'm going to use this, and to make it up to you... He's like, I'm going to help you with your relationship. I'm going to marry you and Barbara Hershey <laughs> in a church. I'll marry you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll marry you. I swear to God, Peter Falk, I'm going to marry Keanu Reeves. And he brings the two of them to an abandoned church somewhere. Okay. Well, you're jumping so, a little bit ahead. This is pretty far ahead, but this is a well, major issue I have with the movie. Yeah, but what, what do we need to talk about? In between, well, he has that great the marriage like, in the church, that conversation that I thought was like pretty funny. Um, yeah, where they're just sort of talking about like he, Peter Falk delivers his whole like, so, like you know, monologue on art, yeah, and the artist, and how what is what is the phrase he keeps using like this is a reality impacting or impact reality? Or, oh, like, oh, oh, he, he says, keeps saying uh, like this one phrase that I can't remember. He goes, I feel reality impacting here. Yeah, he keeps saying reality is impacting. So, like, you know, the whole, one of the major themes is the meta theme of, like, these two things, like, feeding each other and what, what really is causing what. And that's kind of his, like, how he kind of, like, through sophistry um, defends his essential, like, real-life plagiarism. Yeah. Where he's like, yeah, but where did you get those those lines that you, you know, you delivered to, to Julia. Yeah. Like, where do you get these like notions of what love means and what you should be saying in that moment? Like I get, I bet you it's cultural and cult and the highest forms of culture are like the, the, the pure artistic expressions. And so one yeah. is the same and we feed into each other. So what is really, am I stealing or am I just <laughs> contributing to the endless cycle of feedback and whatever? Like he gives this really like dumb, <laughs> it's the dodgiest way to get yeah. out of basically being like your life. I'm going to turn it into a radio right. show. He's like, he's like, w this is why I think he's kind of like the writer making fun of himself almost where he's yeah. like, yeah, there's a lot of ways in which like a writer is I'll make them write the schlockiest, most like lowest common denominator soap opera shit. Yeah. Think they're an artist and like need all these bizarre rituals in order to like quote unquote get in the zone yeah. and create and then they end up just being most akin to like a used car salesman or some sort of like slimy like insurance guy or like a fucking you know a guy trying to sell you a timeshare or yeah. whatever there's something very oily so and I, I about just, him I liked all of that wouldn't it be cool if at the end uh, Peter Falk just like disappeared and they, and <laughs> the they were like smoke. wait did it was he real 
What if what what, what if he was like Bagger Vance? Mm. I never saw the legend. And then of the movie Vance. ends, and then you. Look I don't think at anyone me, did. Is he like a little I never did. mirage that Matt Damon? But just this like a mortal <laughs> figure. But uh, okay, uh, we should talk about this thing now, where when, when he's like, "You guys should get married." Yeah, because he he's trying to like pass it off as this, uh, you know, sort he of keeps, conciliatory yeah. assist that he's going to give Keanu. He's like, "Look, I know <laughs> I borrowed from your life, but like, let me help you two out. Actually, let me alley oop this bad yeah, boy. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna have you guys married in a very very small ceremony. It's just gonna be me and a priest that I managed to find, right. um, and we're gonna do it in this abandoned church, but it'll be legit. And so Keanu very very naively. You because know, he's he, already been duped like twice at this point. Yeah, it's like sh- he's he's already at the shame on him section of the full. This me. is strike three. Yeah, yeah, this is strike. Three. <laughs> Better way to put it. <laughs> and so he goes to the church, and um, Peter Fox there, and there's this priest standing at the side, and then you know they uh, they go up and they do their vows and stuff, and they're kissing, and then Keanu suddenly realizes that the priest is actually the head of the New Orleans radio station that he works at. No, one of the actors. He's one of the actors, sorry. One he's of the one voice of the actors. actors. He drops a script yeah. when he thinks he's holding a Bible. And he's wearing a wacky disguise. And then he yeah. ends up pulling off his He pulls his beard, beard and mustache off. off and he's like, it's you! And they get into like this, you know, goofy Scooby-Doo chase around the, the church trying to punch Tripping each over other. over all the pews. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Barbara Hershey takes this to mean that Keanu was in on what just happened and was like also trying to dupe her. Because she was very reticent about being in a long relationship with him. She had already had enough tumultuous flings in her life. And she was trying to settle down with somebody bland and close to death and oh, yeah, rich. They, 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 so that she could just win yeah, that's a bunch her, of this money. This gynecologist, <laughs> she was uh, like, like dating a little bit as well. Yeah, yeah right. And, that's uh, her motivation. I, I don't think we ever established that. That's she true. comes down, she's wearing big sunglasses. She's like snap and gum New York, kind of like yeah. Catherine Hepburn type who's like, I'm done. I've, men are scum. I'm through with men. I'm t- I'm just gonna find find a nice sixty five year old rich man with a heart condition. And, yeah, you know. And and so she's again going, again also that you make the Catherine Hepburn comparison that very much fits in the, with the sort of light nineteen forties screwball comedy yeah, exactly. yeah. kind of thing. And she's like you know the fast talking you know big city woman who comes here and she's done with men and she's just gonna you know like like you know find one and use them to like you know. Right, just be just, set financially for the rest of her life. Exactly, because she's, uh, you know, sadly acutely aware of like that time frame and like her clock ticking and all yeah. this kind of like her saleable nature, which is like shitty. So by so when we get to this point in the movie where her and Keanu are getting married, she's backing away from all of that. Keanu's like naive and pure and simple love has been powerful enough to win her over. And again, I, I hey, I will say as much as we've kind of dissed Keanu's performance. You know, he does have that that naive, upbeat quality. Honestly, I think if this were not set in New Orleans and there were no accent, I think Keanu <laughs> would work so much better. It could, that could be really true. Although yeah. that said, because he was fresh in my mind um, from uh, um, I Love You to Death, a couple of times I, I did think, I wonder if River Phoenix would work in this role. I think Ooh, he I don't could know pull River Phoenix off. well enough as an actor, I don't think. But, to... So I haven't seen my own Private Idaho, but what I was thinking of yeah. in terms of slightly broader stuff that's more successful than uh, I Love You to Death uh, is just him in like the opening sequence of Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Where right. he's young Indiana Jones. Or Stand right, By Me. Right, 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 right. Well, he's much younger there. He's a there. little kid. Okay. But I, I would probably say you'd still run into problems but you might you would lose the uh you might get the ability to like feign an accent and like have a bit of like smoldering handsomeness that would like disarm somebody but i think you would lose the innocence that like keanu brings that is I, I don't think river phoenix ever really he's like a precocious like homeschooled like weirdo kid kind of he was like a, a seattle art kid and shit like he's like not uh he and never he- looked like Pure and naive. He doesn't come across <laughs> as goofy, which no. is what Keanu has naturally within yeah, him. Is a the, goofy, yes, boppiness. It is. It's so funny. I, I I can't wait to you know get further into this podcast. We just like watch Keanu's progression from as we watch the goofiness fade away. Yeah, yeah. Until and we see John Wick emerge. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All the layers melt away, and it's just John Wick. We watch him slowly harden into sad Keanu. 
sad, yeah, angry, I can't wait to see. vengeful Keanu. And then we get to watch him burst back out of his shell at age 55 when he plays Ted again. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Guys, I can't back to wait. Square one. I yeah. cannot wait. <laughs> So, River's Edge 2. What are the kids up to these times? <laughs> <laughs> Oops, they're all dead. The two boings in the River's yeah. Edge. He's like, <laughs> um, So basically, the Keanu Reeves gets pissed at the church, and Barbara Hershey is like, oh, you all set me up, and she runs away Wait, and, okay. and gets in the car. We've got to talk about this, because Keanu, he realizes that, you know, oh, no, this is... This is just a big ploy. Yeah. This isn't a real priest. And he's chasing them all around the church. Yep. And of course, because the way weddings go, you know, the groom <laughs> is inside and the bride's going to walk down the aisle. And Barbara Hershey just steps in and sees this scene yeah. of, you know, it's like this, this wacky scene of, you know, him chasing this guy around the church. Yeah. And immediately she just is furious and leaves. Yeah. And Classic then, romantic comedy misunderstanding. But okay. This is, I like romantic comedies in general this is my least favorite thing this is my like my least favorite romantic comedy trope the um because when you it's just the walking in and seeing something that's out of context and then running away before anybody can explain just just the stupid misunderstanding or miscommunication it's like a thing that always frustrates me is uh like romantic comedies that are where the mere premise is built on a lie because then you're like, well, of course, when you need the, like, end of act two, like, <laughs> downturn where, like, things become difficult and they, like, break apart and then they have to reconcile, um, that's going to happen because obviously you've, their f- relationship is founded on a lie and so she's going to find out that he right. hasn't been, like, that he didn't divulge this one piece of information and then right. and then she'll become mad at him and they'll break up and then eventually he'll, like, make a big apology. Like, those things frustrate me and, like, and this thing... When Keanu didn't do anything wrong, she just misinterpreted the situation. And so now then we have to watch the next 20 minutes of the movie where she's mad at him and is going to leave and go back to that boring gynecologist. And we have to watch him like try again and again to win her back. And it's all because of just a misunderstanding. Yes, I They're agree. Like, he didn't do anything wrong. It's not real conflict. It's just a dumb misunderstanding because she like walked into the room <laughs> at an awkward time. But... And, and and it's just it, it's it's lazy writing. It's lazy writing. But do you know what this misunderstanding gives us? But we get the moment where Keanu riding a motorcycle hits a turtle. Hits a turtle, <laughs> and it sends him flying into a pond. Remind you of anything? Crash Team Racing. <laughs> <laughs> CTR. Uh, Keanu's wait, 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 chasing. Wait, wait, wait. Do you want to explain that reference for our listeners? There's just a racetrack where there's turtles that literally bump your cart up. And also, <laughs> before we have recorded the last two episodes, you two have played like half an hour of Crash Team Racing. Yeah, just a couple. That is true. We play a, a lot of cups. Crash Team Racing. A classic <laughs> late 90s like video game. Like a Uka game. Cup and an Aku Cup. Aku Cup. Tiny, uh, tiny stadium. Listen, we're so close to getting Spyro as a character. Yeah, <laughs> and we're just so excited. <laughs> and I'm just so excited did to play Did he drive a car? Or does he fly? I mean, did Mario drive a car until Mario Kart? Yeah. No, no, Spyro, they're all in carts. Okay. That'd be wild if he was he could, If he could fly, it would be, yeah. It'd just be a moot point. point. Just a straight line over the there's, whole track. It's not like Diddy Kong racing where there's a, a plane area. Yeah. But um, all I, I was saying is that that was, for me, like a, a very, very delightful section where Keanu... <laughs> Is riding his motorcycle. Also, this is the second film where he's ridden a motorcycle. Yeah, yes. What a weird one for like a motorcycle cameo in this. Well, because he, he doesn't even have a motorcycle. He borrows like, is it the priest or like the the, the actor's motorcycle? motorcycle. Isn't the actor like, I've got a motorcycle. Cool priest. Take mine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that guy's the coolest guy that I want to know more about. And he's he, jerking off before he does his lines. He can do all these voices. He's riding a motorcycle everywhere. He's jacking it and riding his cycle around yeah, town. Yeah, he's as Maybe much at the of same a, time. He's as much of a dedicated artist as I mean, he's so. A, Dedicated also to Peter Falk. Yeah, yeah. Uh, guys, where? Why isn't this like a trilogy? Just following Peter Falk, going into a different town each time, yeah. getting uh, like embroiled in some other people's personal life, pissing off some other ethnic group. Yeah. If anyone has read the book, I'd be curious. I don't really feel like reading it. There's other Yosa books that I'd rather uh, read. B- listener, send us an email if you've read this book. Uh, Keanu Podcast at gmail dot com. Yeah, tell yeah, us how it stacks it. up. It'd be really helpful. But um. But yeah, anyways, he just hits a turtle. It's freaking funny. It's fu- it is funny. He it's hit like, a it turtle. Actually, it's, as much flies like, into the air. It is literally like the Looney Tunes water. shit. Yeah. yeah. The <laughs> context for it makes me mad, but the actual <laughs> moment of it happening is funny. It's so he's good. just miles away. He had to. He fell in the water. He had to walk home muddy, and he apparently he just made a beeline that evening into the early, into morning for Peter Falk, didn't he? Well, he's he still trying Peter to Falk convince later. Barbara Hershey that. 
she's got it all wrong. And he bumps into Peter Falk before he bumps into her. Oh, no, he finds him. He goes also, to the cafe. Also, can I, I, one thing I want to point yeah. out. So in Keanu's first scene, we see him seemingly like flirting with this other girl at the radio station. Who He's not flirting with her, really. Like, Well, she has a crush on him. It's clear. And he's not interested. Oh, yeah. But then because of this whole mix-up, she finds out about his crazy relationship, and he thinks like she'll be a sympathetic ear to him right. later in the movie. And then even at that point, she's like, I, I would never be seen with the likes of someone like you. Right, she but, just but she's also him gone for up. like an hour. Yeah, like her, her 180, nobody cares about also, at this yeah. point. Yeah. She's like, assuming a lot based on the... I mean, it must be rumors, but like... It's just because his aunt Julia is in his office pissed, but is she also right. like, I we're trying to have an incestuous love affair and it's really <laughs> hard right now. Right, but <laughs> like, it's also it's the same thing with with Keanu's yeah. parents. Not been working who out. Who are basically just like not in the movie, and then suddenly his dad is yeah choking him, <laughs> and I'm like, well, who are these characters? I like forgot they existed, and then yeah, suddenly I, I like didn't know where again. he lived because we never see him at home. Yeah, right, and I yeah, you're yeah, right. That all fell flat. I just there's a lot of like characters who are just come in and out, and like they're all supposed to be these like garden district society people as well in sort of like alignment with the fake soap opera thing, but like. Again, if this if they did the proper like screwball comedy thing more, where people are constantly like, you know, like like you have more ensemble scenes, like people coming in and out yeah. of houses and stuff like that, why did like, they think like a New bigger Orleans, supporting cast. Why did they think New Orleans would be like a good? It feels so arbitrary. I have no idea. Why, yeah, why just you know, you know where this should be set? Peru, Peru. <laughs> no, Near Lima. Do you, do, do you want to hear Keanu do a Peruvian accent? I don't. Yes. <laughs> I just uh, want okay, it to be I, set in Peru. I don't want anyone to do an accent. No, I was, I was gonna, it should be set in Chicago. Okay. That seems yeah. good. A Chicago uh, radio station. The city, what women San want. Dimas. <laughs> so be- just set, set all the movies in San Dimas? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I but guess I, it, is it I feel like 1950s is Chicago involved? has like the yeah. right kind of ring to do me. Do they think incest Because there's good. incest, it should be in the South. <laughs> Yeah, put it in, like, Montgomery. <laughs> Such a weird spot. Yeah. Because <laughs> also, it's like setting it there just has all these... Uh, uh, I wonder... Maybe it was a thing... J.K. Southern There's listeners. so I'm little sorry. about the, like, the actual story that's specific to New Orleans. Yeah. I, I wonder, did they just, like, get a tax break to shoot in New Orleans? And then we were like, let's just rewrite the script around there and oops actors now you gotta do accents oops it's now it's accents right it's funny though because it's set in new orleans but it still doesn't even feel like you don't really see any major landmarks when you're watching this movie so it's like it, it's one of these things where it's yeah, like they don't incidentally luxuri- in new orleans they don't luxuriate like, in yeah. the setting at all because like i mean new orleans is a is a beautiful city you've with been like, there yeah you've both amazing been there. cool unique city right it's so strange to set a movie there if you're not purposefully gonna try and use the like just natural visuals you yeah, get. just go really even obvious with it like just be in fucking bourbon street for a second or like yeah be in the garden like they're literally in the garden district like there's all these like gothic giant homes with like hanging moss just ha- like what, have, be, a, have things have someone take a stroll around there and like have somebody walk in like the big above ground cemeteries somebody yeah. have have a romantic scene in jackson park just like, be right obvious at the water's about edge it. yeah are there river's pla- edge are there places in new orleans yes, yes. Oh, thanks, guys. Dude, New Orleans is fun. You should go. Yeah. Dude, okay. we should all go together. We'd have a good time. Have a nice time. You can just drink we'll, Bloody Marys in the do, streets. Okay, uh, we'll do an episode in New Orleans, live fan meetup. Live for, from New oh Orleans. My God. Can't get enough of Keanu. For all, like, maybe, may, okay, maybe two of our New Orleans listeners. Yeah. Two at the most. Right. Hopefully, oh, we'll, we'll drink one. some hickory infused coffee and eat some beignets. Yeah. And we'll just record right on the river. We'll, we'll, do, we'll, do our best yeah. we'll do our best impressions of Keanu in New Orleans. I'll drink a whole fishbowl of Hurricane oh, and God. then just get so trashed while have, we're talking about the, the movie. I'll um, film it and just put it on the internet. <laughs> shit, what's that? I'm just throwing up pure red. Sazerax. Those are good. Sazerax those are, are good. Those are good. Yeah. Ooh, a muffaletta Ooh. from the Italian <laughs> shop down there. Ooh, yeah. Olive tapenade. Yeah. So, and uh, oily pastrami and ham. Mm. Pile of mode. I'm talking ice cream on the side. <laughs> so this Dude, is a New podcast about, is about New Orleans. We're giving you our best recommendations of what, what, what to eat, what to eat. We're telling you the Wikipedia like top. I am telling you like literally the third most popular food item at Yeah. TripAdvisor and just sort of like reading After off the main page. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, anyway, so what else happens in the story? Oh, so then Peter Falk he convinces Keanu that he has to, uh, he has to like find Barbara Hershey and get her back and has to bring a gun to to intimidate this 
Peter Falk is literally is making with... reality television for himself yeah. to yeah. watch. And he's like, no, what, okay, listen, hold on. But what if instead, you have to win her back. He's with that gynecologist. Let me just take this gun, and I think she's staying here. Meanwhile, he's already, it turns out, set her up to be at these places. Yeah. So, like, he's like... You know he's engineer. He's a creepy guy. But this is also where he's terrifying. Yeah. This is also and and this is, uh, is the part when like he there's a part where they even make you think that like Keanu is going to murder them. Yeah. And mm-hmm. uh, and this is the part that's intercut with with him like doing a one man performance of the final episode of the radio drama. Yeah. And where it gets like like very he's like a devil. Yeah. There's, like flames. Are... It gets like like satanic and stuff. Right. And then, and, and, and it it like because he makes fun of funny. Albanians and they burn down and they burn down the place. They they finally like that was the last straw. You made. One more joke about the fucking Albanians. <laughs> We're setting your entire radio station on fire. There, we like, we talked so about this. Yeah. So, <laughs> like, <laughs> but also at, at this point, and then you, but then you're seeing uh, the visualization of this final episode. But then, like Keanu is in it, right. and you see him with like a gun, like like uh, you know, pointing it at. Barbara Hershey and the gynecologist in in the car, and you're like, oh my god, is he gonna actually kill them? Is like Peter Falk like driving him to murder? And that's where I'm also like, what? Why is it like this? I thought this was a wacky <laughs> comedy. Yeah, and then he does, but then it turns out obviously that it's his. He's imagining it. He's dreaming it or something. Yeah. He's dreaming having murdered his. Lover, and then he doesn't. His aunt lover. And then Peter Falk drives. They, so, and then he doesn't, and it's just her. She's just, I guess, sitting alone in a car. She's just like, contemplating. This made me laugh because he runs to her car and just opens the door, like, and she, just, she screams. <laughs> and it was so funny to me because I was like, like "No, here I am." He is acting and like he an has utter a gun. freak. Yeah, yeah and he's he's like, like, "Are you holding a gun?" He's like, well, "He's like kissing her," and then the gun like rolls out of his belt and like hits him in the leg, and he goes, "Oh!" And she goes, <laughs> "What is that? A gun that just fell out of your pants?" And he's like. I, I will not lie to you. <laughs> yes, it is a gun. <laughs> you, I was thinking about maybe shooting you in your head Carcassa. because you were sleeping with a gynecologist. So yeah, she's like, oh. up, and she like is like dead serious about it, and then sort of laughs it off after he explains. He's like, she's I thought like, I was going to scare you. You're so crazy. Yeah, <laughs> but you know what? I'm a wild one myself, and yeah. it gets me hot in my britches. Let's go down <laughs> in the back seat. Yeah, and then they they make they make sweet New Orleans, New Orleans love. Yeah, with one another sweet in the back like of a But this is a PG-13 movie, so we don't see it. We just see the following morning as they uh, are looking disheveled and with. Less clothing on. Yes. And then, 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 what they, then they, a couple articles <laughs> of oh, less. And, and then once again, Peter Falk, this character who exists outside of reality, a fire truck starts coming down the road toward them. They hastily yeah. put on some clothing. And then at this point, I like, I, I imagine we all could guess what was going to happen with this right. fire truck. Yeah. And a fireman comes out and pulls off his his. his Big hat. Who is it? Oops, it's Peter Falk. Ah, uh, it's the Falk guy. It's the Falk man. Falko. <laughs> <laughs> hey. Waka Falka. It's a Falkalino. Yeah. Woo. Uh, and so he's stolen a old municipal fucky. vehicle for the safety of the town. And yeah, but it's magical realism, so we don't know. And he but changes into the uniform for a cardinal of the Catholic right, Church. And he puts on a... An Irish accent. And, and I finally was offended because we're all Irish here. And he started doing an Irish accent. I was like, well, now I'm mad. How Ugh. dare you, And then he sir. said a line that made me so mad. Really? And I'm so happy it's in the quote section of, of uh, IMDb. Okay. Lay, lay it on us, Jake. So, hold on. What really steamed your vegetables here? <laughs> what steamed? <laughs> what steamed Jakey's vegetables? He goes, he goes, life is a shit storm. And when it's raining shit, the best umbrella is I. <laughs> and I was like... Somebody please blow up the this my TV right now. I want to, <laughs> I want to watch this movie. Is that? <laughs> and I was like, all right, that's fine. Uh, I'm also, happy we're I'll, only I'll, like three minutes away from this. Also, as, despite all the t- diarrhea talk on this podcast, like yeah, that was last time. It, it, it was, but in general, okay. Here's the thing with with me with movies. I don't like it when you when people use elaborate analogies in film involving feces. I'm like yeah. that. It just is like. Off-putting to me. Yeah, I like, like my like, feces. I don't like pure. that line. I like the scene in Dumb and Dumber when Jeff Daniels shits the toilet. Yeah, l- that's l- how like, I like my like, poop jokes. That's good, b- yeah. but don't just don't turn this into something profound. But okay, here, yeah. guys, hard I'm, disagree. I, 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 of course, of course. Okay, <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna deliver a scorching hot take. Yeah, as scorching hot as my fucking asshole, and I'm fucking diarrhea is everywhere. You're probably right. Oh. <laughs> Not nothing's hotter than that. Come on. Okay, I. Uh, 
I have never liked the Outcast song <laughs> "Roses" because oh, I'm like, yeah. it is smell like poo poo poo. Yeah, ex- because yeah. of that. Because th- they taught they have poop in and the shit. Co- in the chorus, but like literally they have a line about poo 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 yeah. in the chorus of the song, and that kills it for me. Yeah, I know you really? like to thank your shit don't stank, but lean a little bit closer to see roses really smell like poo poo poo. Yeah, I yeah. mean, yeah. That, that's really just a, like if poo-poo-poo. there were just different lyrics, I would be I would enjoy the song, but I I can't take it seriously. It just bugs me. <laughs> Crazy <Yeah>. bitch. <laughs> I was <just> like, <laughs> <laughs> old dumbass bitch. <laughs> that song is so funny. Yeah, that's a fucking classic. That's that's I don't like the song roses because I'm just like, guys, if you're gonna make good. Like R and B song, don't sing about crash, poop. Crash, what about crash. spread for me? That's a good song. Spread, spread, spread for fine, me. totally fine. I can't, I can't wait to take you home. <laughs> I just can't take it seriously. Poo poo poo. I can't take it seriously. <laughs> Outkast. Now that we're talking about them, they're like a sillier band than I was ever thinking. Dude, about. no, this is so classic though. Those songs are great. I'm sorry, yeah. Miss Jackson. We're really that. This, yep. is, this is a hot take too. Real. All of these songs are great. I just don't like roses. <laughs> See, I'm just fine. Yeah. I would like it if it had one. If, if just if the chorus was not about poop. Do Big Boy and Andre 3000 not get along anymore? Is that why Outkast does not release yeah. any new music? I don't know what. I think they had like some creative differences. <laughs> I will say, <laughs> to put it lightly, I fair enough. I saw Big Boy live. Yeah. At a San Diego Comic Con party two years ago. That's dope. The weirdest environment yeah, on a hotel that is rooftop. Super weird. Yeah, and I was like, "Why is this happening?" But also, Big Boy is doing bombs over Baghdad, and this rules. Hell yeah! And oh, yeah. I am so drinking we'll free Baghdad. drinks <laughs> and uh, eating free food. When and this I was say free. super, you say man. <laughs> Everybody's just trying to like Yay, cheer, DC but about <laughs> comics. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anyway, this is a podcast about the band Outcast. Yeah. Um, They're good. Uh, good, good, good music. Good music. Um, oh, um, guys, what, what else we have to talk about? So with this they movie? just it ends like it ends in this stupid. <laughs> Goddamn, this is yeah, it is very stupid. Peter Fogg at this point is like a nonsense character. He just drives away <laughs> in a stolen fire truck, dressed as a cardinal, dressed as a cardinal, pretty inconspicuous, <laughs> to go. Just I guess do everything his, is red. <laughs> do his art. Yeah. Um. And then Julia and Martin sort of... They go to Paris. They Well, they're walking down the street discussing... Again, this probably makes more sense in a book w- written by a obviously famous writer because it's in a book that was published by him and which yes. he's writing about himself. So the expectations aren't as like lame as when like... They're both now, like I guess, inspired to like be in love for the right reasons and therefore are capable of producing art. So Keanu's like, I'm going to be a writer. And, oh, wait. And he's wait, like, you're going to be a singer, aren't and you? And wait, she's like, I'm a singer. He's like, you we, never said that shit before. Guys, we haven't talked about this. <laughs> I'm a singer. Through this movie, another problem Guitar. I have with it is that Keanu apparently is an aspiring writer. He mentions this a couple times, like to Peter Falk. Peter Falk is like, ah, you like, like, a, like writing is like a calling. You have to do it all day, every day. It's like you have, you, like you're compelled to do it. Right, yeah. There is one scene where we see Keanu typing briefly at a typewriter. And I think he groans and then kicks his typewriter out a window. He's like, this shit's boring. He's like, boom. Yeah, it's just like, it's so half-hearted. Yeah. Like, again, this, it, 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 it's a dimension that could be there that could make the movie more interesting. It could give him a reason to like hang out with Peter Falk and look up to him if he's an aspiring writer. But at no point do we see that he has any passion for this at all. Which, yeah. once again, I think is part of the book. In the book, I think Peter Falk is like, Pedro rather, uh, which is the same name they use in the book, is like a more, a less fantastical figure. Like you, I think you still like go, like you said, go into the soaps they create and they more and more reflect reality. But I think there is, yeah, more of that kind of like student teacher relationship going on more clearly as opposed to what it is, which is like a kid who's just talks a lot about writing, but mostly about the fact that he should move to France because it's the fifties and he's remembering all the expat writers. Doesn't he have one scene where he says that? Yeah, but, but that's then all this in, movie's going to give you. Yeah. It's, Listen, it's he says he wants to move to France and then like he says it again. Right? At the very end? At the very end, and then they're there at the I end. I will say, I was <laughs> impressed. The open... And he has a boat, which he's doing, I guess it's a houseboat, but he's doing pretty yeah, well. Yeah, I mean, the, the end credits roll over this this long shot that begins with the, with them on a boat, and then it pulls back, and you see they're on the Seine yeah. in yeah. Paris. And I was you can like... see the Eiffel Tower. Yep. And yeah. I, I will say, I was like, 
Well, hey, they did go to Paris for like one shot. That's like kind of impressive. That is that is impressive for one shot. They, of a it's movie like they to spent the money to, yeah. to fly them over there. Right. Yeah. It was it, you know like a, a small crew and the two actors and like yeah. they did it. So, so the so the the idea is that like there. they did it. You yeah. know that's and also she's the takeaway. Sing cabaret songs and he's gonna write Hemingway shit or something. Yeah, cause yeah, the Great American I guess, novel. I guess she's a singer. I guess even though she doesn't sing once. That's, yeah, it just it ends. It ends so weak. It's so confused. It it and it was so clearly supposed to be this like. It feels like not clearly, but like it feels like it's definitely trying to be this like doff of the cap to like you said zany movies from the past, that were you know while also being based off of what I assumed to, was like a fairly respected piece of literature at the time and so there it was supposed to be maybe like a prestige comedy of some kind yeah yeah doesn't it kind of feel like it's really like it is shooting for the fences and so the saving grace i found with it was that it fails in in pretty spectacular fashion guys can, <laughs> yeah can i talk about the director yeah so it's started by john Emil. uh who is a british director who really like uh what kind of uh his like breakout uh, project was the British uh, TV miniseries The Singing Detective oh, in the right. mid-80s, oh, nice. right, right. which I've heard of. It yeah. was then made into an American movie in like 2000, I think like five yeah. with Robert Downey Jr., like pre-comeback. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was like his breakout movie. Then he made uh, his breakout project, then he made some movies. This was his second film. But yeah. then he had a run of uh, of not necessarily good movies in the 90s and 2000s, but movies that we've heard of. In 97, there was a movie that I enjoyed a lot as a kid. Okay. The Bill Murray comedy, The Man Who Knew Too Little. Nice. Yes. You guys ever see that as a kid? Never seen not it. Not as a kid, but I've seen it. Okay. Uh, and then, uh, in 99, he made Entrapment. Ooh. The heist movie with Sean Connery and Catherine Zeta-Jones. Oh, she does sexy yeah. lasers. She does sexy yeah. lasers. Uh, it is not a very good movie. Sexy lasers. But, sexy it, but, lasers. It, had, but it had the shot... Of her wearing tights, and there's a shot of her butt slinking under a laser, and that basically made... That's, like, why the movie was a hit. Her butt's yeah. near a laser. Yeah. And then, like buckle this. up, kids. Horny. In 2003, <laughs> he directed The Core. Oh. Uh, sexy core. <laughs> <laughs> And that, that, by the way, if you couldn't tell, was That's Jake's about- impression of Sean Connery talking about the sexy core. <laughs> Sean Connery, who's a fan of uh, ice cream with a core in the center. Ben Jerry's core. Yeah, dude, he likes Ben Jerry's core. They're good. They're cream. good, man. Get like a little tube I've got of chocolate one in my freezer in right now. Oh hell yeah! Yeah, I like the you ones. You don't that... really, do you? Yeah. I, I bought Why it. would he make that I up? Bought it the other day. <laughs> this is your random. I, thing I was to at the bodega up. and then I looked in the freezer and I was <laughs> oh, like, oh, I, I want this ice cream. I'm gonna get it. <laughs> dude, what? that's you can get the what kind of core. What kind of core does your yours yeah. have? Is you it want, chocolate or raspberry sauce? Because I've seen the ones with the like little your raspberry core. core. You, that you, could you be like know? a fun yeah. uh, ad. Uh, neither. It is. Um, I believe I got the flavor uh, caramel sutra. Ooh, that has that wow. has salted Shexy. that has Shexy. a core Shexy. of salted <laughs> caramel. Ooh, I like that. I had it before. Dude, Dude, it's good. Oh, good ice cream. We should push to have Core Ice Cream sponsor us. <laughs> we wait. Actually, wait. Lewin. Wait. wait. Van Lewin. No. 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 Guys, I could actually make this happen. <gasps> Can we be sponsored by Core? Okay, first of all, it's Avengers not Core. <laughs> it's it, it's it's just it's just Ben and Jerry's. <laughs> no, no, no. There's other there's other ice creams that do the Core. I think. <laughs> okay, no, guys, I've told you this before. Jerry Greenfield of Ben and Jerry's is one of my dad's college friends. They yeah, were yeah. roommates. Like I know him. Oh shit, I forgot. I like I can say this publicly. I know Jerry, and he's a good guy. Yeah. I. Uh, my sister actually got lunch with him recently because she moved to Vermont and he lives in Vermont. <laughs> uh, Jerry, come on. Uh, 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 it's well, probably how can a long we shot. Feasibly get it? What, what movie would he talk about? I'd go to, I don't know. I'd go to Burlington or whatever to do an episode. I would talk yeah. to Jerry of that. I, I can just... <laughs> Honestly, yeah, dude, are you kidding me? <laughs> about the Matrix? <laughs> I, yeah, just about like Matrix Reloaded. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Okay. Uh, Did you like the, it? Listeners, no promises. Chunky Monkey, what's that about? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wavy Gravy? Yeah. What's going on? What if we got Jerry? That would okay, be so, so Everyone, don't so get good. too hyped, but. But we are going to attempt this. I, I, I haven't seen him in several years, but he's a good guy. If he's a good guy, then he'd be on the podcast. Be- uh, 
I have Ben's also cool. I just don't know him as well. I've, I haven't seen him since Ben's I was a kid. Ben's the dark genius <laughs> <laughs> in the, the lab torturing. making all the flavors. Yeah, Fuck, he- it's not perfect. Yeah. American dream. How you doing in there, Ben? Are you doing all right? That's my Shut impression up. of Jerry. Shut up. <laughs> I'm making art in this world of shit. Needs more raspberry fudge tort. Mm. They're just like that. So yeah. thanks for tuning in, guys. Uh, Maybe. <laughs> guys, is there anything else we should say? No. It's no. A, not a very good film. Um, anyway, John Emile made the core. <laughs> <laughs> With complete disrespect to John Emile. That's as much as Actually, we're going to say, say about this guy. Um, he has since then just, uh, he directs a lot of TV, like yeah. a ton of TV shows. And I feel like that's kind of the ideal career for him. Yeah. Uh, he's just, he's just, you know, it's like a regular, solid working director was, on a ton yeah, of TV stay shows. stay in your lane, I was John. very <laughs> unimpressed with the way this movie was directed. Not even to say much about the writing, which we've already mentioned is terrible. I thought, the, I thought the directing was just kind of pedestrian. There was no shots, no, no camera movements, nothing that like particularly stunned uh, me or made me feel. I like, will say, enraptured I think, with the story. I, I, that I, I, was, I didn't think it was like visually spectacular, but yeah. I, I did think it like nicely changed style when it would go into the the you know visualizations of like the radio episodes. I just wanted the movie to be that. For the yeah. most Those part. were better. Yeah. I mean, then you got like you know Peter Gallagher and like John Larroquette and yeah, stuff like yeah. that. It was good, and it all, it all seems fun. There's like these like these like weddings and yeah. then but like yeah. illicit affairs. A good it, cast squandered. It's all yeah. gauzy looking. It's anyway, cool. that was too. Oh, okay. By the way, we got to make one thing very very clear. This movie is not called Tune in Tomorrow. It's called Tune in Tomorrow. Dot dot dot. Oh, there's ellipses, yeah. guys. Sorry. Yeah, there are Sorry. ellipses. Don't worry. That will be in the episode title. I will not forget. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's the official title of the film. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Tune in tomorrow, dot, dot, dot. Uh, does anyone say the title in the movie? No. I don't think so. Seems like a giant missed opportunity. Yeah. So yeah. You, You'd tomorrow. think they would say it all the time. Yeah. Right. Like every other scene. Yeah. But they don't. Yeah, and, man, and, and that and that again, and that is why it doesn't work. Exactly. But I will say that this is an important movie because this is Keanu's first real stumble as a performer. Yeah. And you can you, the thing is you can catch it in a whatever chunk you choose on YouTube. There's seven parts to it. It's all free. It's all free. So like you, there's a there's a low cost to entry here. If you're just curious and you don't want to suffer through the full thing, you can watch like basically any part, and you'll see. Keanu's what we're talking about. What we're yeah. talking about. <laughs> yeah. It's all there. We'll even post it on the Twitter. Yeah. Uh, are, are we? We might even do it before the episode comes out. Maybe you've watched it already. Yes. Uh, if you follow us. Oh, and uh, Some of you have. <laughs> because you should follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Keanu Podcast. Yes. I want to say thank you to Brian Hose for our theme song. Thank you to Emma Logsdon for our artwork. Uh, I, I said it before already, but uh, you know you can send us emails, keanupodcast at gmail.com. It would be a big help. If you got a spare minute, if you could rate and review us on iTunes, helps people find our podcast. Uh, you can discuss the episodes in our subreddit, r slash thrillums. Uh, Jake, you want to say anything? Uh, yeah, you can follow me on Vero. I'm trying to get a Vero account off the ground here. How's it going? Join me on the ground floor of this one. You can get me. You guys are going to want in. You guys are going to want in on this one. this is going to the friggin' moon. And I'm, and I'm, I'm going to make this very, like, audience participatory. Um, so I need, I want, I'm looking for suggestions. I'm looking for, I'm looking for communal content Wait, who, to who be had are, here. Who, what's your Vero name? At, at <laughs> the real JT. At the real JT on yeah. Vero. Yeah, yeah. This is like unadulterated, just pure me. Like I want you guys to know me. Like and there's also Jake After Dark and all these kind of extra like premium content you can get. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> that's behind a paywall. Jake After yeah. Dark they're, is they're behind, behind a paywall. paywall Jake has but... his personal Instagram too, where he'll have little chats. Yeah, live I'm not doing. Do. I'm not coughing up any of that that video content unless I get some Bitcoin. Yeah, in my but you, Bitcoin purse. If you, you got to jump through some hoops yeah. just to even find out where this paywall is. Right, you have to follow the viewer account if you want to get my After Dark content. <laughs> 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 so, Jake, thank you very much. Everyone follow Jake on Vero. Yeah. And be excellent to each other. Be excellent to I each other. I love all, each and every one of you. <laughs> <laughs>